Broadcasting from an undisclosed location somewhere in Ireland where we're crazy for film, television, video games and much, much more. I am your cult leader, Tom Pod, and the host of the only podcast with an actual cult following, the Pop Call Pod. Welcome to this week's show. We're putting it up a little bit late and that is for good reason. It's because of our breaking news, which is, of course, Star Wars related. You can take this as part of the Kool-Aid because the truth is, this is going to be a long one, folks. This whole episode is going to be balls to the wall. So... Get your balls out, I guess. I don't know. Get your walls ready. Okay, Star Wars Episode 9 officially has a title in that it's Star Wars Episode 9 Rise of Skywalker. So this is our title for Episode 9. A lot of people are not that impressed with the title. I've saw going on some of the rumor titles before this, people are, I guess, a bit happier with it, but I don't think people are too happy. It takes a little bit of the mystery out of it somewhat. But then again, we don't entirely know what the title actually means. Could Rise of the Skywalker refer to Luke? Could we be possibly getting a retcon of Ray's parentage? In that in Last Jedi we were told they kind of came from dust farmers, insignificant people or whatever. Could she actually be a Skywalker? Which is what we kind of suspected a long time ago. Could it be relating to Kylo Ren, who is half a Skywalker? Although I guess he goes under the name Solo, but you understand where I'm coming from. So we don't entirely know what other details we got from Star Wars Celebration. And again, this is still ongoing. This came out literally about an hour ago as I'm recording this. That's why the episode is late. I wanted to... Hold off because I heard we were getting a title and a trailer for this. Star Wars is going to go on a hiatus after this one. Now what that means, who knows, could be two years, three years. Might just be a hiatus from the main series. We could get spin-offs and uh, Ryan Johnson's strategy. Who enti- we don't entirely know, but I think that's definitely what people want to hear. Because they feel like Disney are milking the franchise a bit. And it's hard to argue with that to a certain degree. I uh, normally would talk about the trailer and trailer trash. But again, I only just saw it, so let's talk about it now more detail uh the big takeaway that everyone has from this is first of all ray looks to have really evolved her jedi powers presumably she's been reading like the text that she got left at the end of the last jedi she kind of leaps over i think it's a tie fighter flown by kylo ren at one point she does a massive flip he's definitely come on as a jedi we know that uh, there is a time gap in between the last jedi and this as well for one, Rey is wielding the lightsaber that Luke Skywalker owns. Again, it's another Skywalker connection. This looks like it's really... They're really pushing the idea that this is going to be the end of the Skywalker saga, I guess. So, presumably, it's going to tie that in a bit. I also heard them saying that they might actually tie it into the prequel trilogy as well, which wouldn't be altogether surprising, I suppose. But that lightsaber was destroyed in The Last Jedi. Now it's been repaired. We also see Kylo Ren repairing his helmet, so... It looks like it's undoing certain things from The Last Jedi, which I guess a lot of fans are going to be happy with. I think Ryan Johnson actually even said he doesn't really care if they do that. He's happy with the, if they do that. Fine. What else do we get? We got a new droid called Dio. Like Ronnie James Dio, I guess. Dio has rocked for a long, long time. <laughs> it's a, It looks like just a camera on wheels. Sorry, wheel. Yeah, it's like a unicycle. It's practical, as in they wheeled it out on stage. And of course, it's a Star Wars celebration. So everyone was like, woo! Waving a lightsaber around like they're six years old. <laughs> Uh, what else did we get from this trailer? Lana Calrissian is back. We see a character that may be his daughter. She was asked about it on stage and she kind of went, oh, you know, he could have kids anywhere. Which is probably the closest one gets confirmation. He's also wearing like the same clothes, like color clothes and cape as well. So that's another suggestion. It really looks like it's it's going to analyze the impact that Luke Skywalker had because he does the opening narration Mark Hamill does. And we also see him holding a medal at one side. Or, well, we don't know who it is actually holding a medal. I was going to say Ray, but we don't know he's holding the medal that he was presented. Or presumably, well, it's either him or, or uh, Han, I guess. And really, we don't know who's looking at it. What's the significance of it? It just seems like they're trying to give a finality to the, the whole Skywalker story. They're on a desert planet to start, because apparently we don't have desert planets in Star Wars. Everything's a bloody desert. They also are in a far setting, which sounds... Okay, it's suggested that this could be Endor. And it's not just because it's a forest. It's because in the background, there is what looks like a piece of the second Death Star that was blown up. So Return of the Jedi, I guess, took place on one of the moons of Endor, which was a forest. So it would have been in range of the Death Star when it blew up. And that brings us to something controversial. Some people are very excited. Other people think it's an unnecessary twist. I guess spoilers, but if you've seen the trailer, whatever, uh, Emperor Palpatine 
is back seemingly because he does a big cackle at the end and they brought Ian McDermott on stage and said hey I'm back kind of thing so I don't know how he's back or why he's back does that kind of ruin Vader's sacrifice at the end of the original trilogy I don't know I to be honest I did I, straight away I didn't click that it was <laughs> the Emperor I thought it, it was meant to I was like who the hell is that because for a second it sounded like Mark Hamill doing the joke where I was like oh great Luke has gone crazy again <laughs> <laughs> they didn't completely wreck on The Last Jedi, but no, seems to be the Emperor. So, a lot of stuff in this for people to pour over, and certainly they already have started. Leia is seen hugging uh, Rey in this as well, at the end. She has been confirmed to be in this film, they're going to use unused footage from The Force Awakens, so... Again, it's nice that at least one of the original characters is going to be in it. Mark Hamill, whether he's going to have a physical presence, we don't know. And then the, there's a question of how they're going to bring the Emperor into it at all. It could be that he's maybe pulling the strings... And trying to, you know, voice uh, the dark side in Kylo Ren. Or maybe influence Rey. And we could have, you know, a, an angel and a demon. And that we'd have Luke on one side and the Emperor on the other. It sounds kind of dopey. I don't know. This is... It's a strange choice to bring this back. I wonder are they just making a big twist so to get people excited. But whether they can make it work. From a creative standpoint, who knows? I don't... This doesn't seem like we got anything fresh. I mean, how many of these Star Wars films have to revolve around a Death Star? And now they're bringing back a character that has been dead for 40 years or whatever. And I know there's... People are going to say, oh, well, there's lots of different possibilities. I know there is. It could be a clone or it could be time travel. Uh, because those, in, I think, have been introduced. At least cloning has. And I think time travel is in Star Wars Rebels, maybe. So there is, like precedent for how you could bring it back but it seems kind of a shame but i don't know it's hard to see maybe it'll work better in execution but yeah that's our first bit of news just came out maybe i'll have more thoughts on it next week but i'm sure we'll get more news from star wars celebration we have also um i will say this just to cut the cut it off the pass disney plus announced their service i haven't read it in depth because i i wasn't really expecting to cover it in detail on this show, I'll cover it next week when I have a better chance to, to dig into it because it's a massive story and really the show is already going to be incredibly bloated. So let's get on to the rest of our Kool-Aid. That was, I guess, the story one. There's not even going to be eight stories this week because I've had to cut a few things because <laughs> this is packed. I have to cover a review of Hellboy as well. That'll be mercifully short. Shorten the film, thankfully. And I'll also have to review the second phase of Marvel movies. So before we get, go any further... Let's talk about some casting news. Because we were talking about Hellboy, we'll talk about David Harbour, who has been casting something. First off, though, John Cho, who has been cast in Netflix's live-action Cowboy Bebop TV series. I have never watched Cowboy Bebop, heard great things. Certainly, uh, the fan base seems to be very happy with this, and it looks like it's one of those animes that would be more welcome to a, to a live-action adaptation. So we will see how that works out, mind you. Didn't they also adapt Death Note, and that didn't turn out very well. Either way... Bit of a weirder casting news is that Vin Diesel has apparently joined the Avatar sequels. I think he just posted an Instagram picture with James Cameron being like, I've always wanted to work with him. And they said they were on the set of Avatar and they left it vague and no one announced anything. And uh, the, the thing with James Cameron now, the way he's working with these Avatar movies, it could be like Vin Diesel is confirmed and then we won't see Vin Diesel in this James Cameron film for 10 years because <laughs> it's such so late into the into the production schedule. And when we see it, it could just be Vin Diesel covered in blue CGI cat face or whatever. Who knows? Well, we got a lot of comic book casting as well this week. And this weird Suicide Squad sequel that's not a sequel, it's a reboot, but everyone is coming back. Oh, God, this movie wrecks my head. So it's James Gunn's Suicide Squad movie. And I'm sure there's at least one member of the cast here that we've said, they're in, they're out, they're in, they're out. Here's the latest. I'm going to stop recording on this movie soon because I'm sick of hearing who's in, who's out. And whether it's a reboot or a sequel, because they see, they seemingly don't know themselves. It was a reboot, and then they're like, "Hey, bring them all back! Hey, welcome aboard, Joel Kinnaman, who is back apparently. Viola Davis who's back. Last week we said Captain Boomerang is back as well. Now the most interesting aspect is that we said Idris Elba was playing Deadshot, and that was apparently true. Now it's changed, so Idris Elba is in it, but he's not playing Deadshot. They're going to write a new character for him because they felt it was almost disrespectful to Will Smith. And they, I guess, want them to be dead shot at some point. So, not really a reboot again. I, d I don't know what that means. We don't know who Elba's going to play. 
there was some speculation based on the run of comics. He said he was going to pull from Yale and Ostrander's run of Suicide Squad. And in that, uh, the Bronze Tiger is a key part of that team. So maybe Idris Elba's playing that. I don't know. It seems like a lot of rewriting is going on. One of the interesting aspects of this is also the fact that we uh, suspected Dave Bautista was going to join. Now, that was in a world where James Gunn still hadn't been rehired for Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Now it looks like he's not going to be in the movie because he's joined the cast of Zack Snyder's Netflix zombie movie, Army of the Dead, and it looks like the film will basically con conflict. So I don't think he's going to be in this one. Maybe he's just happy that Marvel rehired him. Maybe he's going to stay loyal to Marvel based on that alone. Don't entirely know. But we got a lot of Marvel news as well this week. And it's all to do with casting. Kumail Nanjiani is going to join the cast of the Eternals. We talked about the Eternals a bit last week. Angelina Jolie is leading the film at the moment. Chloe Zhao is set to direct. We don't know a lot else yet. And we will get to that a bit more when we talk about some brief Marvel news we got this week. What we do know is that it's presumably going to involve around near mortal beings known as the Eternals and their antagonists, the Deviants. And they were all created by Celestials. So exper Celestials experimented on humans, basically, and created these immortal races. So it's going to revolve around that. We'd heard it was going to be a love story between Icarus and Angelina Jolie's character. I can't remember her name. Oh, it doesn't matter. Who cares? <laughs> we haven't, there have been Celestials in the Marvel Universe already. Ego, the living planet, was a Celestial. So, you know, that might be a small seed. And I also said that technically... Uh, Thanos is an Eternal. So, whether or not they'll tell these guys, we don't know. I'm sure we'll learn a bit more about Marvel Slate soon. But the Black Widow movie has also started some serious casting, a lot of casting news for this this week. So, we've heard that it's apparently going to come next year, first of all. It's going 2020. Florence Pooh? 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 Oh, I call her Florence Pooh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Florence Pooh? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. That's oh, that's one of the simpler names I mispronounced. That's frustrating because it's only four letters. Pew. Pew. Ugh, I don't know. You're, ugh. I'm going to really struggle. I guess I saw another name I'm going to have to say. It's, <laughs> I'm going to make it much worse. Rachel Weisz is also in the film. David Harbour. They're saying he's going to be like a contemporary to Black Widow. Which, I don't know, maybe he's a fellow spy. Have joined. And they are looking at O.T. Fagbenel. Fagbenel. From The Handmaid's Tale. Who's going to play a villain in the movie. I told you I was going to struggle with that name. Oh... These names, man, they're going to be the death of me. So yeah, a lot of casting for comic book news. I might as well get back to another bit of comic news. We of course had Shazam out last weekend, which we'll talk about the box office in a sec. This has been successful. The Rock was a producer on this film. We've been hearing about Black Adam for years now. He took to social media to talk about his character, Black Adam, who was set to get a solo film for a long time. And they felt it was kind of better to separate these characters out rather than have them share their movie. Because in the script originally, they were both in it. And this is apparently the rock side story. This is what he said on Instagram. Why Black Adam wasn't involved. He said the challenges were, as you guys can imagine, you're trying to tell two very big origin stories in the world of comic books of this DC universe. Two very important characters trying to tell both their origin stories in one script. I didn't think it was working. Finally, I called up Warner Brothers, Toby Emmerich, my good buddy who runs Warner Brothers. And I said, brother, we have to split these stories and make two different movies. He said, you know what? It is a great idea and let's do it because that's how Hollywood works if you're The Rock. You just call up one of these executives and say, here's what we're going to do. And they're like, you're a genius, Rock. Here's a million dollars. I love how it was that simple. He's like, hey, give me my own movie. And they're like, yep. Yeah. I mean, I guess you wouldn't say no to The Rock, would you? He might just lay, uh, lay a smack down on your ass. Like He said as well that they're, they've been working on the film for nearly a decade and he hoped to film in a year or so. I mean, uh, Shazam was a big movie. It was successful, certainly. I think uh, a Black Adam film, there could be money in that. I don't know if he deserves a solo film. I guess in a perfect world you could have Shazam, Black Adam, and then they cross over. But they're already working on a script for Shazam 2. So who knows how that's going to work. They got the original writer, Gaiden, back for that Shazam sequel. So it's really, the wheels are already turning on that. So who knows when this Black Adam movie will really come out, but... Should be interesting. There was a, a brief tease towards him in Shazam. And we get on to the Marvel tidbits, a little section, because we got, we're got we kind of in the run-up now to uh, Endgame. We're not very far away at all, but two weeks away. So there's on you know press interviews, and we're hearing talks about Kevin Feige and all this. So just a few brief announcements we should cover. So 
Avengers is officially three hours now. There was a bit of back and forth. There is not an intermission. Some people were aghast at this, which is like, oh, are you serious? Did you expect there to be an intermission? Why, like, that would be an, an other half hour that they'd lose on Showtime. Like, obviously no one remembers the Lord of the Rings movies where you just had to tie a knot in it and wait. <laughs> Three hours, just, you know, you have two weeks. Start training your bladder, people. Right? It's that easy. <laughs> Marvel have also said they have a five-year plan for the next slate. And what does that mean? They said this slate was basically in place before they got the rights back to the Fox properties. So, look, let's get a few things straight. If you look at Marvel's Phase 3 slate that when they announced that a few years ago, there have been changes to that. Films have been moved around. For example, Inhumans was just completely gone, turned into a, a rubbish TV series. Spider-Man was added. So it's not like they can't change their plans, but I don't think they're in any rush. They said especially X-Men is unlikely. And I think if there is something you can't rush into straight away it is X-Men remember they still have at least one X-Men film coming out theatrically probably another and the X-Men you know they've been around for two decades now people remember them you can't just rush into putting another one in there that's like an ace up your sleeve you can hold on to that Fantastic Four on the other hand I think they probably could put those in I just don't think they're going to rush into it because they know they don't want to mess this up and they have plenty of other films they have to make. You know, they, they've worked on contingency plans, I'm sure, of who they get back and what they get back. And, you know, they've been planning this for a long time. So I don't think they're in any rush to incorporate these characters. If for some reason, some magic reason, well, not magic, that's something we might talk about, whether or not Marvel are not at the not go, about to go downhill, but whether things are about to change for them. Going forward, we'll see. But in general... They haven't really screwed up yet. I, I can't see them screwing up now. Why would they? You know, they, they've got a lot of good films in the pike and if Endgame is as big as it all, we all think it's going to be. You know, it's breaking pre-sale records everywhere. It's booked out in a lot of places. Then they have no reason to either be afraid or have to rush into putting the Fantastic Four into the universe because if for some reason the next phase of films did fall flat in their face they can just be like hey X-Men and Fantastic Four they're here finally and then people will come rushing back I think Shang-Chi is another film that's apparently gearing up for production it's going to film in Sydney so it looks like at the moment those three films are really really close to getting together The Eternals Shang-Chi and Black Widow so Again, that could be our slate for next year. But regarding the slate, we're not going to hear anything official until after Far From Home, they've said. Some people are hoping it'll be after Endgame. He also said they don't know if they're... They haven't... Well, it's not that they don't know. I'm sure Marvel know. But they haven't officially said whether they're going to be a Comic-Con because that would be a spoiler for Endgame. Comic-Con does come after Far From Home. Now, in the past, they've kind of either done their own event for their slate or they've, you know... Done, they're part of Disney family, so D23 could be a place to show it off as well. Then again, they have so much that they haven't shown us at this point that they could always throw a bone to Comic Con. But yeah, that's a brief bit of Marvel news because we're coming up to the end game. It's going to be very a Marvel heavy few weeks on this podcast. Well, let's talk about a different type of comic, and that is comic as in funny. <laughs> See my transitions. Oh, I just realized it was a much easier transition to make. Never mind. Will Ferrell and Adam McKay, long time partners. You know, not, not in a romantic... Well, maybe in a romantic way. I don't know for sure. I don't want to add to any salacious rumours. They've ended their long-time producing partnership. They were partners along with Chris Henchy with Gary Sanchez Productions and their female-centric label for women in comedy called Gloria Sanchez Productions. That's a label that, you know, they've made a lot of films together. For example, Talladega Nights, Step Brothers, The Other Guys, and Anchorman. They also have produced a lot of number of successful films and TV series. You know, the one that comes to my mind is Eastbound and Down on television, but there's quite a few of them out there they launched the website funny or die as well so you know they they pr were massive be successful a lot of people are sort of pointing to Holmes and watson as the reason for this i don't think that's likely you know they they had a, a mess up <laughs> i don't think that would have put the break in this together i think what's more likely is that they were both just going creatively in different directions the statement they put out said the last 13 years could not have been more enjoyable and satisfying for the two of us at Sanchez Productions. We give massive thanks to our incredible staff and executives 
and all the writers, directors and actors we worked with through these years. The two of us will always work together creatively and always be friends. And we recognise we are lucky as hell to end this venture as such. So, doesn't really the possibility of them working together again. But at the same time, it's kind of an end of an era. They, you know, they've been a massive uh, production house in comedy. So, a little bit sad because they have made some good for them. Some of their comedies are, are rubbish. But of course, then something like Step Brothers or the first Anchorman, I think, are, are brilliant. And I'm sure we'll see more Will Ferrell in comedy. And more MK kind of directing, maybe some Oscar contenders. I think they've, they've just gone different ways creatively. You know, of course, Adam McKay has last two films have been very successful with uh, The Academy, Big Short and Vice, for example. So, yeah, it's a little sad, but it's, it's not the end of the world. It just seems like there's no real controversy or contention. It's just a business decision. And sometimes that happens. So, well, let's talk about a film that we have been talking that I talk about in detail about the many times it's failed but now it looks like it's succeeding and that is Akira it looks like Warner Brothers are taking a run at this again it's been awarded a tax credit to film in California of 18.5 million stating that they will be spending upward of 92 million in the state now Taika Waititi is still attached to direct this but what's interesting and I haven't seen a lot of people say this to avail of that tax credit they need to start production in the next 180 days. So essentially, within the next six months, Akira has to go into production if they want to get this tax credit. So by the end of the year, we should know for sure whether Akira is, is going to, to make it to the screen again. And I want to talk some about something with this because obviously, I think it was my sixth episode, I did a development hell on Akira, which was basically talking about all the failed versions of the film and why it didn't go anywhere. And as it happens, that was quite useful this week because people saw this uh, production listing for it and they were talking about plot synopsis. And I was like, this seems familiar. So they were they were freaking out about an Americanized version of Akira because that's certainly what it sounded like from the synopsis. They mentioned Neo Manhattan. And I think they said like, oh, you know, Tetsuo was a bar owner or Canada or whoever it was. And I realized very quickly that this was the same plot synopsis they had when production went ahead when Jean Colette Serra was trying to make the film over what was it 2011 he was trying to make that so I think it's more likely this is a placeholder because a few things we do know is that Taika Waititi has been very vocal about adapting the anime more than no oh, sorry other way around he wants to adapt the manga more than the anime for one and this sounds very much like just straight the manga I can't say I know the difference. I haven't actually read the manga myself. On the other hand, though, he has said that he wants to cast kind of unknown Asian actors, untapped talent from there. And whether or not he gets studio pushback on that, I'm sure he will. But that sounds like, he, at nothing else, he's trying to be fairly faithful to the property. And that doesn't sound like that. I think it's most likely they just took the plot synopsis that was lying around and said, this one, <laughs> because they had it there and no one was using it. So that's where we're at with Akira. I wonder if it'll get made this time. Who knows? If you want to hear that, I think it's the sixth episode I did, Development Hell on Akira, talking about how many times it's failed. But regardless, we have a massive story here. This is why I didn't want to talk about Disney Plus this week, because this is a huge story already. So I'll come back to Disney Plus next week, analyze it, get a few more details. Maybe we'll have a bit more information by then on it as well. So we're talking about CinemaCon. I'm going to go through the presentations, the ones that stole a lot of focus. Uh, CinemaCon, in case you're not aware of what it is, it's a convention. It's generally not kind of for the public. It's for people who own theatres. Of course, journalists get into it and stuff, but it's sort of a thing of like, look how successful we were this year for you guys. Look at all these great movies and here's some more great movies and uh, you better fucking buy them <laughs> or not buy them, show them. Like that was actually what was weird like, when it came to like these theaters because obviously theaters are at a, a weird point now with streaming and that kind of thing. There was a lot of talk of what certain sides wanted. So studios really want a sort of premium watch at home thing. I don't, and they wanted I guess to cut theaters in on it. They wanted to cut down on the window between theater and home release as well as far as I know. So there was a bit of an anti Netflix thing going on. Like, I think it was like Helen Mirren was like on stage and she said something like. I love Netflix, but fuck Netflix. And I got like the biggest cheer the whole thing, <laughs> which is like, okay, don't don't address the problems with the theater experience. Just 
just shit on Netflix, I guess. I mean, why not? I, I shit on Netflix enough as well. But moving on to the actual CinemaCon. So we'll start with Disney's presentation. So as you can expect, a lot of this presentation, because of, you know, was very recently after this, is that they've now owned Fox. So it's highlighted their new divisions. They're getting 20th Century Fox, Fox Searchlight and Blue Sky Studios, which is their Fox's anime division. That kind of was in a big graphic behind them as well as you know the brands you would expect, which is Disney, Disney's Animation, Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars. Or sorry, well, Lucasfilm more specifically, I guess. They highlighted a few of the films that they now have as a result of the merger. They highlighted Dark Phoenix, Ford v Ferrari, and Stuber. We'll come to those in a sec. What is also of note is that they showed a glimpse of New Mutants. So considering what CinemaCon is showing to theatre owners, that would indicate it's going to get a theatrical release. We don't entirely know what it means yet. Haven't heard much information on that. I don't know whether they're going to do reshoots, whether they're going to promote it or just dump it unceremoniously in theatres. Remains to be seen so far. What was also interesting is they talked about the franchise they'd kind of gotten from the Fox merger. And it is interesting because it's a vague statement in one regard. But it, it could just be lip service. So they have said that they want to, or hope to continue Avatar, which is like no shit. The second one's not out yet. And James Cameron's made like 12 more of these in a, a warehouse in New Zealand somewhere. Kingsman, again, one of them's already started filming. So they'll do that one at least. Maybe they'll make a third one. Maybe they'll do spin-offs. We don't know. Planet of the Apes. Um, again, this is one that they probably could take a bit of a gap from. I talked about these franchises they acquired last week as well, our last episode. Again, I, you know, like, they can do more with Planet of the Apes because there is still a big gap between the last movie and the original movies. Whether they do something in between then, whether they do something akin to the astronauts coming back again, we don't entirely know. I don't think it's something they're actively developing, but I'm sure at some point they can put it out. And again, Fox is... What they can do with Fox Table is put out riskier ventures, which is a good thing for them, I think. Alien. Okay, well, that's one I think they have to really be very careful with, because I think at the moment that Alien franchise is not looking healthy. Maybe you get the original guys back, I don't know. The Maze Runner is one they mentioned, and I, that was really weird, because I think they've done, they did the main trilogy of it. I think like, there's like two prequels, I think. But it wasn't something that set the world on fire. I mean, they were low budget. They did okay. I think overall the budgets got higher and the gross got less <laughs> as they went on. So I'm surprised they kind of pushed that line. But maybe they just want to show how diverse this catalogue is. It's not just sci-fi and nerd properties. It's also something for the young adults. Deadpool, of course, they've mentioned that they're going to make more Deadpool. Again, we don't know if this means something into the MCU. This might be something when we hear Marvel Slate. I think if there is a character that can address that, you know, like, hey, I survived the merger, it will be Deadpool. Anyway, let's get to some of the footage I showed. First up was Derek Phoenix. Now, of course, me and a lot of the world has been critical of this. Apparently, the footage they showed was a lot more positively received. They've also said it's the perfect send-off for our X-Men team, which is no surprise. This is the end of the X-Men series, at least the main series. So the reaction has been really positive. They said it's a lot better than previous trailers. It shows more action. And focuses on Jean coming to terms with her powers more. So that's all positive. I saw my local cinema put up a massive Sandy for recently. So <laughs> this is coming. Whether or not it's good, we will see. But it does certainly sound like this footage is a bit better. Again, some of this footage I'm going to rush through because there's a lot of presentations. The Lion King, we have a trailer for it this week. I'm going to talk about that in Trailer Trash. What they showed here, they showed some footage of the scene where Mufasa and Simba are looking at the, out at the Pride Lands. Really positive as well they said it looked right out of a nature documentary sounds like a shot for shot remake it's just realistic which is also sort of my impression of the trailer it's, it just seems a bit dull and pointless to me but everyone's obviously going to see it they said the slight dialogue changes and the beats stay the same they also said as far as the dialogue people have been saying that their lips and their mouths move as if they were animals so don't expect expressive faces it's very much grounded in reality because, of course, that's what you want with talking and singing animals, I guess. It sounds like we might get a film that might look a bit drab because of that, in my opinion. The, the sort of style and exaggeration and expression of the original is not going to look well, 
if they try to do it in a realistic style. So I guess they're just doing a realistic style. At which point, why? <laughs> I don't know. This, I'm still not sold in this movie, but again, the people that saw the footage were massively excited for it and so is most of the rest of the world and we're all going to see it. So just deal with it. <laughs> The Morning Report, the song that was not present in the original, that was only in the special edition on home video, they've confirmed that's not going to be in the movie, which isn't that surprising really, considering it wasn't in the original theatrical version either. We also got footage from Disney's next live action remake, which is Aladdin. Not as positive. And of course it comes down to that freaking genie again. <laughs> they showed the musical number A Friend Like Me, and of course that has Will Smith singing and rapping because that's what Will Smith does, and the genie is Will Smith. Footage is, as I said, not incredibly positive. They said it just doesn't look good. Like I've seen the reactions are really weird. I've been like, I've taken the actual quotes here. One person said it was fun and another person said it was a nightmare for you. <laughs> so the jury is still out in this one. I haven't been that impressed with it in general, but and it sounds like no one else is either. So I'm sure it's going to make a lot of money regardless, but yeah, like... What are you doing? <laughs> Making Will Smith rap again. I thought we left that in the days of Men in Black 2. Come on now. Is that the last one we rapped in? Maybe. Well, the West came before that. Wicka wicka wah, wick. <laughs> Toy Story 4. They showed the first 17 minutes of the movie. I haven't looked at descriptions. I don't want to get that much of the movie spoiled for me, to be honest. But they acknowledge that Toy Story 3 was a great ending. And it sort of finished Andy's arc, but they felt the movies were more about Woody. So this is very much a story about Woody. The impression on the footage, even though I haven't read what it's about, it's going to be emotional. It really focuses on Woody in depth, apparently. There was people saying they were almost crying, so... Yeah. And if that's just the first 17 minutes, imagine how the film's going to end. They showed Endgame footage. Again, we're two weeks away. I have no interest in hearing anything more or seeing anything more of Endgame. Ford vs. Ferrari. This is James Mangold's movie. With Matt Damon and Christian Bale, I believe it is. They said it looks good. Looks different to other racing movies and that explores the kind of work that went into him. Like the, the racing cars, getting them to go fast, the engineering and testing of a car. Sounds very technical like, and apparently there's a lot of award buzz around this. I could see it definitely getting some sound awards. At least from from that Im impression that I heard. Paramounts were next. They have quite a few films on the way. They showed a few images from movies they have coming. Mostly from 2020. Top Gun Maverick, of course, the sequel to the original with Tom Cruise. They showed an image from that. Coming to America, the sequel, which I think is called Coming To, as in the number to America, which, like, ugh. I hope that's a placeholder. That's an awful title. Then they hyped up SpongeBob, which is coming back with his third movie in 2020. And then they showed Dora with the same trailer that we talked about in the last episode. So they really kind of pushed their, their family slate there, which I'm sure the cinema's change will be happy with. Let's look at some of the other footage they showed, because some of it's great, and some of it you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> Rocket Man, six to seven minute montage from the Elton John biopic, and people are really praising this. There are, there's a lot of Oscar talk on this after seeing the footage, apparently. Taron Egerton, is, like, especially, they're saying, is fantastic. The singing is really great, and it looks like, judging off this footage, they're taking a sort of warts and all approach, which is what this needs. When you look at something like Bohemian Rhapsody, it was very sanitized. Actually, speaking of Bohemian Rhapsody, we were, obviously everyone's talking about like, oh, they they cut this or they didn't really cover that. It came out in China and they cut like any mention of gay stuff, which there wasn't much stuff for that much of that to begin with. So imagine it in China, like God, I can't imagine it, how, how that looks in China. Oh well, they look like it's going to get an R rating as well based off the footage though. And it'll obviously cap what it's going to earn, but good positive reviews and good performances and good music will certainly not be that big of an issue for this film to succeed if it is as good as everyone seems to be saying it is, which from CinemaCon definitely are really positive. And then you have one of the movies where you're like, what? <laughs> which is Crawl. So they have your you have their big budget stuff that they're showing off. And then they show Crawl. So this is a Sam Raimi produced horror film. About a father and a daughter being attacked by alligators during a hurricane. The most Florida sounding movie ever. So yeah, of course it takes place in Florida. No surprise there. So the characters get trapped in a house during the floods with alligators in the house as well. Now, okay. This sounds like a sci-fi original movie, to be honest. 
but it is what it is. It it didn't look good. <laughs> it doesn't mean it doesn't sound good. So that's not surprising. They said it could be stupid fun, so fine. Then we got Sonic the Hedgehog, which uh, like a lot of controversy with this film in general because it seems like they're really hiding behind the footage. All we've really seen are Sonic's muscular legs. It's going for an action comedy vibe, and that apparently worked quite well. The impressions on this was that it looked like a bit of fun. The real scene stealer was Jim Carrey as Dr. Robotnik. People were kind of saying, like, this is his comeback. This is the Carrey we wanted since the 90s, <laughs> which is so odd. They showed two trailers, actually, and one of them was Robotnik-centric, so I think they're really going to push him. When it comes to the marketing, don't be surprised if you see Jim Carrey more than you see Sonic. And what is really startling is that they made some changes here that are odd. So Sonic is apparently on the run from the government. And not only that, he's an alien. He says something like, we need to save my planet. Which is like, what? <laughs> this sounds like, this sounds insane. <laughs> Which is like, it actually gets me more interested in it. Because, you know, Sonic is great, Sonic's cute and all that, but if you want to make a weird sci-fi Sonic movie with Jim Carrey and a humanoid blue hedgehog that's an alien, I'm, yeah, you know what, that, that unsurprisingly gets my attention. <laughs> The reaction was very mixed. Kerry got a lot of praise and he was there as well, so... Could be fun. It sounds batshit insane. Which has my attention. So good on you, I guess. Then we got another weird sci-fi premise. <laughs> because I guess Sonic is now sci-fi. Ang Lee's latest film. And this pits... Modern Will Smith... Against a younger Will Smith. So I guess it's kind of like Looper. A bit. Description made it sound like Will Smith actually looks like he's kind of Fresh Prince era and he's been digitally de-aged. So the basic plot is that the older Smith is meant to kill the younger clone of himself. The crowd was impressed by it and apparently the trailer had some emotional beats to it as well so who knows. Maybe you can get Will Smith to rap for this one. Gemini Man rap, surely. Oh, you can have a music video with two Will Smiths in a rap battle. Oh. Like Fresh Prince versus, like, I guess, just Will Smith. Because like, I suppose he just raps under Will Smith now, does he? Well, he doesn't rap at all, really, except he might just show up to a party and be like, Woo! Summertime! That's my Will Smith impression. My Specifically, it's my Will Smith rapping impression. You don't really get a chance to do that anymore. <laughs> Terminator, Dark Fate. This is probably the biggest film they showed at their say One of the biggest films at general there was a lot of buzz and talk about it coming out of CinemaCon so we've got to look at our new Terminator from it played by Gabriel Luna he has the ability to split which like that you could do some stuff with that I think T-1000 I guess could split sort of but he'd come back together so I suppose not the action was really intense sounding and some like when you look at the action the other ones it was very kind of sanitised and not that interesting except maybe Salvation to be fair Although that just kind of looked kind of drab, but they said this is quite intense. The film is set in Mexico City, so that's why there's a large Hispanic cast in the film. And apparently even the Terminator theme has a sort of a Mexican flavour to it, so... I, I, that's what people said. People sound excited about that. That sounds awful in my head. Maybe it's just I'm, I'm so jaded that you expect Hollywood to just do like... Dun, 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 with like a mariachi band or something. I don't know. The big reaction to this footage was, of course, the return of Linda Hamilton who saves Mackenzie Davis. Mackenzie Davis is travelling through time in this movie. They show a scene where she kind of arrives naked, gets in a vice and takes some clothes. And then I think she's saved by Linda Hamilton, who takes out a bazooka. And she says the I'll be back line. So, you know, they say those, a lot of those lines kind of reverberate throughout these movies. So this time Linda Hamilton is saying it. They also, someone highlighted that the movie is kind of taking place on all terrain. So it's on land, it's in the air and water from the scenes I've seen. And they saw, showed the return of Arnold. People loved the footage and they gave a lot of praise to these new characters as well. I, I think with Arnold, he's playing like the the basis for the Terminator. So that could be very interesting. I wonder when we're going to get a look at this because the, re the reviews for this uh, footage were very, very positive. And certainly I think it could be happening soon. Tim Miller also seemed to know what he was talking about. People were very impressed with his understanding of the franchise and I think he was very emotional presenting it as well so maybe we'll get a good Terminator 3 finally for like after like the third fucking attempt Terminator 3 the third time they're doing it I'd say Universal Pictures had the next show uh, they showed off a comedy called Good Boys it was a comedy film from the guys behind the US office and produced by Seth Rogen 
Apparently it plays like a super bad prequel. The reaction to the footage was quite funny. This actually premiered at South by Southwest already. And the word was positive enough, so... You know, I guess, unsurprisingly, the reaction here was fairly positive as well. There's a few films, actually, as you mentioned. They were kind of smaller, didn't get much reaction. I don't have much interest in talking about them. Abominable, it was an animated film. It sounded quite pedestrian. They basically kind of said, lad, this isn't on there. This isn't their best work. Downton Abbey, again, if you're a fan of the show, it looked like that from what I could tell or from what I read. Last Christmas, this is like a rom-com. I don't, I don't know what else is. <laughs> anything else to say about that. Hobbs and Shaw was the footage they showed that got a massive reaction. The reaction was absolutely insane. Footage apparently looked great. It was incredibly stupid and over the top, which is exactly what you would expect. Lots of explosions. And Idris Elba declares himself to be the black Superman. <laughs> I cannot wait for this nonsense film. Oh, it's going to be so much fun. I can't wait to just turn my brain off with a bucket of popcorn. It's going to be the dumbest film ever. It's going to be the most fun I've ever had in cinema. A... <laughs> then we had Yesterday, Danny Boyle's Beatles film about a world where only one man knows the Beatles. The song renditions were apparently good, but aside from that, it seemed very cheesy. I don't have much interest in that, to be honest. It doesn't sound that interesting of a premise, to be honest. I guess if you're going to do a musical biopic of the Beatles, it's a bit different, but there you go. Then we had the most insane sounding movie. Maybe even crazier than Hobbs and Shaw, if you can believe it. And surprisingly, it's a musical. Cats. I, talk, I spoke about this in my first episode, talking about stuff that could be an awards contender. Now I don't know what to think. So, this is absolutely insane. They didn't show any footage from the film. They showed kind of people talking to the camera and some, I think, rehearsals. First of all, this is not the crazy part. But it, I guess, adds to it. They're using CGI and motion capture to bring the cats to life. So, essentially, the effects are going to add fur to the actors and they're going to make their face look more cat-like. What is crazy is that all of the cats in the film are going to be the size of actual cats. So, we saw sets that were massive. Props that were, like, you know, bigger again. So, it's all these actors in their actual size turned by massive, <laughs> massive props and sets. Now, I haven't seen Cats. I don't particularly want to. It just looks so boring, in my opinion. But is there... It, it, it's not like this in the musical, I don't think. Because I'd be a bit more interested if it was. This sounds absolutely crazy. I, I don't know what to think about this, really. I, if you like Cats, I'm sure you go see it. For me, I'm just like, okay, I have to see how this turns out. I think it's one of those movies that... Once you see a trailer, I'd be like, what the hell? Okay, I'm done. That's all I needed. <laughs> uh, Taylor Swift fans are happy. Anyway, if that's any consolation. Because that was like all the reactions were like, oh my God, she's amazing. It's, like, she didn't really do... They showed footage of her in a movie. Just settle down there now. All right, relax. We'll go to our Lionsgate thing because there's only one film I want to talk about here. And that is Knives Out. Trailer for Ryan Johnson's latest film was shown. It was described as a stylized kind of Agatha Christie style and murder mystery, but more modern. People are applauding the humour and the grit and tone of the movie so far. It has a fairly good cast, but the person they're all talking about is Chris Evans. He's a bit of a, a scene stealer. Like in, in the trailer, he apparently says, eat shit five times. <laughs> so he's really working away from that Captain America stereotype of him. Well, good for him. That sounds uh, interesting. I think Ryan Johnson is a good filmmaker. Even with the Last Jedi, I think people are giving him a bad rap. So we'll see how how that turns out. Hopefully, this uh, this can be a win for him. Last panel was a Warner Brothers panel, and some films were interesting. Other ones were like, "Why are you showing us this?" <laughs> we started with Birds of Prey. So first off, they clarified that Hardy is not a member of the team, but that her and the Birds of Prey cross path. The footage was said to be very colourful, and this f was apparently crazy footage. It sounds like. They meant that it was like crazy as in it's really weird. They made clear that it's not like the Gotham you know. Certainly that's the impression I got from set photos as well. Judging from the comments made by the cast and the crew, it really sounds like this is going to be an R rating. So that might make it a little bit more interesting. I don't know. I've been totally impressed by it so far. But again, it's really early days yet. Wonder Woman 84, they had a very quick 
just action scene I think they showed in a mall. Apparently it was quite solid. Wonder Woman was said to be at her full power now. They showed Kristen Wiig in the trailer, but she wasn't in her cheetah form. Again, this film doesn't come out for quite a while, so they didn't mention anything about why see Trevor's back or anything like that. Joker, uh, people love the trailer, people went crazy for this. Uh, the trailer's now out, so I'll discuss that when we talk to trailer trash. Uh, I wasn't as crazy about it as everyone else, personally. It Chapter 2. A lot of emphasis on our grown-up losers club, as you could expect, especially Jessica Chastain, Bill Hader and James McAvoy. As you would imagine, lots of teases towards Pennywise, because of course that's what the whole movie is going to be pushed as, and of course it's very important. We see Beverly being chased by a naked older woman, and the scene that apparently has the most fake blood ever used in a movie was also shown. People said it was scary, but I would I didn't think the last it was that scary, but does it sound like I'm talking about the shining there? Chased by a naked older woman and the most fake blood ever used in a movie. It does, right? And then what's weird is that they follow that up with Doctor Sleep, which is a sequel to The Shining. So, Ewan McGregor is playing Danny Torrance, and apparently this sounded really good. Really promising look. He said it was unsettling. The shot, there's a shot like where he's in the bathroom, and Red Rum is scratched into the mirror. And it features the character dealing with the trauma of the original film. So, really, really positive impressions from this. And that is interesting, because I... I it's hard to make a sequel to such a classic film and I guess a classic book as well a lot of people don't even realise there is a sequel to The Shining now but it sounds like they nailed it and I think the the benefit of that is that it is so far removed that it's sort of like it can always be like oh it's not a sequel it's a spiritual successor you know that kind of thing just give a few brief mentions about some of these other films they mentioned The Kitchen that was we talked about that briefly before it's the comic book based on the mob wives who take up the job for themselves with Melissa McCarthy and Elizabeth Moss. Apparently it looked okay, but it looked far too clean and well lit for, for the type of film that it was. That was one complaint I saw. Super Intelligence, another Miss McCarthy film from the person who gave us Tammy and the boss, uh, Ben Falcone, who's also her husband. Didn't look good. <laughs> Can you be that surprised, really? Well, it is what it is. I'm sure it'll make a lot of money because they keep making these movies. The Goldfinch... I think this was something I also said could be an awards contender and it sounds like that's definitely what they're going for. The trailer was said to be beautiful. Impressions have said that it should be very popular coming up to award season. And then we had Motherless Brooklyn. This is the last one I'm going to talk about from CinemaCon. This is directed by Edward Norton. It's also starring him. And they've also said it could be an awards contender. It sounds like such a dry, boring movie when I read it though. I don't know. It's, a, it's about a private detective with Tourette's trying to solve the murder of his mentor in 1950s New York. Now, I don't know if that could really work or be awful, depending on how you play it. So we'll see how that works out. It's based on a book by Jonathan Lathem, and it also stars Willem Dafoe and Bruce Willis. So that is it. That is our cool eight. Don't think there was eight there this week, but again, it's a very big show, so we need to keep moving. So we better move on to our quick hits, and they might be even quicker than normal. Starting off first, Snapchat have announced a slate of 10 original series. You can watch these series on the Snapchat app. And just like the Snapchat app, People will probably stop watching these series as soon as Instagram announces their own series. <coughs> James Franco's unseen film Zeroville has finally secured a release. Originally filmed in 2014, the film is now set to release in theaters in September of this year, where it'll still be unseen. <coughs> Prince Harry has called for a boycott on Fortnite. He said the game shouldn't be allowed, saying where is the benefit of having it in your household? It's created to addict, an addiction to keep you in front of a computer for as long as possible. It's so irresponsible. It's like waiting for the damage to be done and kids turning up on your doorstep and families being broken down. Well, I think pointless monarchy should be banned, so checkmate. Oh, sorry. It's only checkmate if it's on a king. <coughs> Moving on to our trailer trash. We, of course, just spoke about episode 9. Don't have anything else to say on that. What we did have this week, one I'll talk about very briefly, was the Adams Family trailer. We saw a first picture of this a couple of months back and I thought, oh, this animation still looks pretty cool. Then I saw the trailer. Oh god, that looks ugly. It looks half finished. Apparently I heard someone say that the animation studio doing this are like a smaller animation studio and it really looks like it. The kind of minimalist style, I, that's what I thought they were going for but now it just looks like it's not finished. It's not a very good looking trailer. They have a really big voice cast attached to this so maybe they put a bit more work into it and it'll be fine for Halloween but 
you're against the clock with animated films always so we'll see how it turns out maybe maybe like when you forget about that it won't be too bad because overall it, it wasn't a bad trailer it was just the animation was like oh that could do it with a bit more work than that <laughs> it was a big week for trailers of course we had the Lion King trailer now I've been very vocally against this film I just feel like it's kind of pointless first of all Disney are kind of screwing up with artists that aren't getting necessarily paid because of the the animated film you know is animated and this is live action so it's like oh it's its own thing well that's one side of it I also just feel like if there's a film that doesn't need to be translated to live action and doesn't really benefit from that treatment at all it's The Lion King especially going with this almost shot for shot realistic taken it just seems so pointless but putting all that aside what can I say about this straighter positive and negative look positive first really obviously the effects are great like there's no doubting it they look photorealistic it looks like a, a nature documentary and that's really good that's gr great work with your effects team no question about that some of the shots are good a few you know the the shot with them on pride rock that looks quite impressive some of the scenes that presumably are going to be used for circle of life they also look good but overall, I think this film is going to be so soulless. Like, it looks like they're just doing a shot for shot remake, taking out the colour and then making them realistic, which is not like The Lion King ever was a realistic story anyway. It's about animals talking and singing and it's really colourful. And speaking of colour, right, so I said it was colourless. A lot of the shots in this are grey or brown or whatever. Look at the original Lion King. The colours are so vibrant. There's like patterns and sometimes it's sur a surreal look. Especially something like I Just Can't Wait to Be King. Look at that scene. Like that's going to be so lost. Like if you, First of all I don't think they're doing all the musical numbers. I think they're doing like four or five. Originally they said they weren't doing what's Scar song called? Um, I know that your powers of retention. Uh, be prepared. Um, apparently they said they weren't putting that in, but I think they've changed their mind, which I don't know. Like I, It feels like just a step down in every sense of the word. I know they're only making this for money and it's going to make a lot of money. Let's be clear. But I don't know. Is there anything about this I actually enjoyed? Scar looks awful. He looks just like roadkill. He's like, just a patchy, crappy looking lion. He's really frail looking. He's not intimidating. The voice doesn't suit him. Chibita Legivore. And that's not against Chibita Legivore. It's just that Jeremy Irons had such a sinister sneer to his voice. And that's not there. Maybe we should be worried as well that we didn't get a lot of voice in this. I think it was just Scar and we've also heard. Maybe we should start hearing some of the other voice actors we heard I think Timon and Pumba very briefly at the end of the trailer I don't know everything about this is just ugh, it does not get, I don't, I'm not getting it I don't know if they're going to be able to change my mind but I mean I'm going to go see it and so is everyone I think so like I guess they don't really have to convince us but yeah it's just uh, it's disappointing because I do I think if they were going to do a live action remake of it there is stuff they could have done to make it a little bit better, but this is not it. Realistic, drab looking. Yeah, I didn't enjoy any of the creative choices they made. Really. The effects are good. That one shot I liked. Overall though, they just kind of slightly changed a few lines and made it worse. <laughs> like, I don't know, whatever. It is what it is. Oh, it doesn't help that I, Lion King is the first film I ever saw in cinemas. So, I don't know, maybe I just... I'm not going to say they rate my childhood because everyone says that, but... Definitely, it hurts more than... More than it usually would, I think. Finally, we had the Joker trailer. And everyone lost their mind for it CinemaCon. Okay. I uh, This is such a strange thought process I've had with this film because the trailer is fine and a lot of people are like applauding for being like oh yes it's not like a superhero film woo this is different they're pushing the genre and yeah 
that there's good stuff about that kind of going into new territory breaking out of the the traditional comic book box but it's just the king of comedy and taxi driver mixed together <laughs> like it's not uh, it's just that seems first of all that seems lazy and unnecessary it just feels like we've seen it if you've seen those films doesn't feel like a joker film which is fine it just feels like but it just feels like they're just like hey make his hair green and it's the joker that'll work and I'm not saying there can't be room for experimentation within that but it seems pointless there's nothing that really sold me of hey ne- ne- this is why we're making a solo joker film or hey the joker's origin needs to be explored it's fine but I- at the end of the day it's interesting I'd not I said originally that when I saw a trailer for this I'd know whether I'd be interested or not I don't really there's some good stuff about it but it really just makes me feel uncertain about the whole thing I don't think there's a reason for the film overall Joaquin Phoenix does look very good but it just seems like a story we've seen before people are like oh see this is not like a comic movie yeah but it's just like another movie it's like a Scorsese movie which by the way a lot of people are forgetting this because for the longest time it was oh Scorsese produced Joker film Scorsese pulled out just before production began now I'm not saying that's a bad sign but again it just feels like someone was like let's make a Scorsese Joker film we don't need Scorsese <laughs> or Scorsese was like I don't need this and they were just like we can just make Scorsese Joker film just make King of Comedy and dye his hair green I don't know it's fine I w- I'd say I'm looking forward to it it's not a train wreck certainly I just think that I'm not entirely satisfied with this trailer but we'll see I'm, I'm excited to see Joaquin Phoenix is taking the Joker though because that looks like it's going to be amazing that's it for our trailers this week a lot of big trailers this week I don't think there's any other major ones on the horizon that I'm aware of but we'll keep it moving in that case so we go on to the box office this week top five we'll do this week number five we have Captain Merrill 38% drop making 12 million you know that film is it's run its course it's it's slowly seeping its way down maybe it'll get a bump when Endgame comes out actually it's still in the top five though so fairly impressive Us made a 58% drop in its third week it's at 152 million domestic now which is nothing to be sneezed at it still did quite well especially on such a, a low budget Dumbo was first last week now it's third 60% drop which is not great for Dumbo I think word of mouth has hurt this it'll be interesting to see how this does overall when the books are closed I, I could possibly even lose money to be honest Pet Cemetery, 25 million it's opening weekend now 20 million budget not not that bad pretty good for a horror I think uh, if it wasn't for Shazam it might have done a little bit better maybe a poor time to release it to be honest and of course top of the box office was Shazam 53 million on a 100 million budget now it's fine that's a fine opening but at the end of the day for a superhero film it's quite small so where it ends up worldwide at the end of its run probably won't be that impressive maybe maybe around the 400 million mark roughly maybe a bit less it really seems like Warner Brothers dropped the ball with this they didn't really market it and I know that might be a bit of a conspiracy where it's like oh they didn't really push it but when you I was looking for this during the week they put out two traders really for the first which is the first thing they didn't really give it a push in that regard nearly every big budget movie I can think of they put out character posters now maybe it's because Shazam isn't suited to that I mean there is a couple of characters though that could have benefited from it there's no character posters for Shazam in fact the same they only had like two posters and one of them was the same image we've had the whole time of him kind of leaning drinking a drink which I heard didn't go down well in some international markets because people thought it was just a comedy. But yeah, Shazam could have done a lot better. I don't think Warner Bros. got behind it as they should. It's a great film. I think it'll be fine. It'll turn a profit because, again, it has a small budget comparably. It has a 100 million budget. And they already announced a sequel. So I think it's a film more people might find. But it's a shame that they didn't put the marketing must behind Shazam. And they have put it behind worse films. And it could just be a case of they figured, look... It's got a low budget. I'm sure it'll turn a profit regardless. Endgame is coming out in two weeks. 
It's not going to have great legs because of that. But again, they could have done better with a bit more push. I think it'll be number one again this week based on the competition. Hack headline, which I've, I forgot a couple of times, but it's back. DC captures lightning in a bottle with Shazam. Ooh, damn fine stuff, sir. <laughs> Bringing us through our weekly watch. A couple of big releases. I think we should start maybe with television. Game of Thrones is back on Sunday, of course, which is the massive one that everyone's going to be talking about, so don't miss out on that. Of course, airing on HBO. Les Miserables is airing on PBS. It aired, I think, on BBC in the UK over Christmas. Overall, pretty positive. It has Dominic West in the lead. Netflix, on Wednesday, we're putting up a Beyonce documentary, I think it is, called Homecoming, that people are very excited about, so I'm sure all the people who think, uh, you know, Bay is queen or whatever. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> all right. Films coming out this week. A couple of ones we have. Little is coming out. It's a body swap comedy with Regina Hall. Pretty mixed reaction to this overall. Don't go on and expect much. We have Leica's new film, The Missing Link. Word when this was fairly positive on the whole. Not as positive as Kubo on the two strings, but that's a pretty high bear. And finally, we have a film I'm going to very, very quickly review, and that is Hellboy, which is coming out, or is out, I guess, by the time this drops. So let's figure out, should you see Hellboy? So I saw this film last night. Another reason I kind of held out was I figured I'd go see Hellboy. That was before the reviews came out. I wasn't expecting good things. And I figured if it's as bad as everyone says it was, at least I can get some entertainment out of me being angry and pissed off, but... Honestly, it's it wasn't even that type of bad. First off, I put this on my list of top ten at the step in my very first episode, which I'm gonna brush up to me being less experienced a podcaster than I am now because this episode is top notch, as you can tell. Um, I don't know why I was thinking. <laughs> I didn't even think it, that it would look great. I think it was just I was reading Hellboy and I was excited to see a Hellboy movie, but God, how wrong I was! Like when I said it's not that type of bad. This is a film I just watch so passively. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend much time in it because it doesn't deserve it, but the story is really basic, which is fine. You might expect that. They keep, for some reason, acting like we expect Hellboy to join the bad guy. Like, she's like, oh, I treat monsters great. And he's like, oh, where are monsters don't have to hide? Ooh. But obviously he's not going to do that. <laughs> like, we're not stupid. It's like the plot of every X-Men film. You know, like, oh, mutants shouldn't be patronised. You can join me and... Uh. And then they do it in this, and it's totally pointless. The action is fairly meh. Forgettable, I would say. And really badly shot, I thought. There's a lot of shaky cam at times, for one. Second of all, things are really close up. And the editing, oh my god, the editing in this movie in general is not good, but in the fight scenes, it just cuts around the place. So, like, a, with a butcher knife, it is really badly edited. And for me to pick up on that should tell you how bad it is, because normally editing doesn't bother me, and you only really notice it when it's really bad. No, most of the time, at least, when it's bad is when you notice it. If it's doing its job, you barely notice it's not good though. The effects in the film are bad as well for the most part. It looks really cheap at times. Some are better than others. Some of the creature designs don't look that bad. But there was one scene at the end that I swear to God, it reminded me of the Scorpion King. <laughs> like, you know, that where The Rock is like a PS2 game playing the Scorpion King. It looked like that. It's, it's towards the end of the film with Ian McShane. Keep an eye out for it. I'm sure you will notice how awful it looks. The creature designs, uh, I was talking about those briefly. Some are good. Others, not so much. Like, I'm guessing some of the better ones you can kind of attribute to Mike Mignola. Because it ripped straight out of the comics. And I think a lot of cases it does look like this is quite faithful to the Hellboy comic. But other ones you're just like, what am I even watching here? It's just like a pile of pus. What's going on? Uh, it's just and, and sometimes it was just overload like you just put too many in, too, many, too many creatures in there where you're like why are you just introducing this creature now for 30 seconds of screen time even less in, in a lot of cases the script in general though is really awful there's so many there's a lot of flashbacks in the movie there's like 4 or 5 flashbacks I think which is so lazy like it's just like here's our character and he he did this it reminded me of Suicide Squad 
And there's get, we're getting a lot of comparisons to Suicide Squad with this film because of the production. Sounds like it was a mess. And as you can imagine, anytime these productions are a mess, this is what you get, a, a shit film. There's jokes. Oh, God, the jokes. Ugh. I can tell you exactly what they were thinking. They were like, we can make an R-rated film here. Make him quippy. It'll be like Deadpool. It is dreadful. There wasn't. I don't think I got any laughs out of the jokes. A few people in the audience chuckled a bit. I, I wouldn't necessarily give that much credence, to be honest. There wasn't much of an audience there anyway. Like, the jokes feel like they're aimed at kids. That's how simple and stupid they are. They're just not very funny. And there's just too much humour to begin with. I don't know why they uh, they really overdid it. And there's like qu- like quips that are awful. Like, oh, uh, you like oh you should stay ahead and blah uh, blah. It's like it, I don't think it's doing it ironically. <laughs> it's not good. Really awful, awful humor. I don't know why why they made that decision. It must just have been the Deadpool effect. I think that's my that's my theory anyway. When it comes to the acting. I don't think they were really clear about what film they were making. Everyone looked like they had a different film in their head. David Harbour, we should talk about him because, of course, he's playing our lead. He's completely lost under the prosthetics here. You can barely tell what's him. It looks really bad, the prosthetics as well. Especially in light. And a lot of the, like, first look we got at this film was him, like, in shadow. And it was like, that looks badass, awesome. And... In light, it doesn't look great. The colour looks a bit off. It looks really fake, kind of... Ro- it just looks like there's way too much prosthetics on his face. It sounds like he's struggling with it. The only thing you could really see him move was like his mouth. He was like... Ugh. And that's the thing. He only It's like he's grunting through the whole performance. And I don't think he's necessarily a bad fit for Hellboy. I just think he was really screwed by the prosthetics and some of the writing really really hurt him then we have other cast members uh, Ian McShane I love me some Ian McShane he's fine in this I won't say he's bad but he seems a little lost like he's not really sure how to play this character and that's down to the film's tone in general where sometimes he wants to be serious and fantastical and then other times it's like comedic and it doesn't really work then we have our villain Mila Jovovich, uh, oh, she is so bad. I look, I haven't seen any of the Resident Evil movies. Like, I haven't seen her in many films at all. I saw her in Fifth Element, where she didn't really have to do anything except wear scotch tape as a dress. <laughs> she is awful in this. I'm guessing is she always this bad an actress? I mean, she's married to director of those Resident Evil films, so I guess that was an easy casting process. She is dreadful. Like there's scenes where she, we, I literally laughed. That like especially at the start, like her reactions are awful. It like every line she delivers as well, which again this doesn't help because again it comes down to the writing, was like a trailer line. It was like join me or I'll be, end of days, oh that kind of crap, and it's like, this is yeah look she's a witch from hundred a couple hundred years old, but give her something. It is really badly written the dialogue is awful at times and that's probably what this comes down to more than anything but there's a lot of other problems with it the level of violence in the movie a lot of CGI blood which always looks a little bit goofy you have to be very careful with CGI blood it it rarely works when you use a lot of it and they use a lot of it in this and it's weird because it's so over the top at times it's funny I don't know is that the reaction you're going for but because of that, when there's moments where you're meant to feel something about the violence, you can't because you're just like, it's it's funny, it's stupid because of how ridiculous it is. Oh, by the way, the rest of the cast, the, the two new agents, um, can't remember their names. Daniel Day Kim was the guy who like turns into a cheetah or a panther. No, it wasn't the panther, it was cheetah, I think. A were cheetah or something. Yeah, it was not great. It was funny, it wasn't very memorable. I can't remember the other person's name. She was like a telepath or something. Again, not very memorable, as you can tell. 
a lot of swearing in the film. Really, really feels forced. Like they were just like, be edgy and you can push it up to an, an R rating. That's what's weird, actually. Like all this CGI blood, all this swearing, all feels entirely unnecessary. And if you took that stuff out, you would probably have a good, a good shake of a PG thirteen film. So they're just limiting their box office more. And originally, when we heard it was going to be an R rating, they were like, "We're going to make it darker, more mature." This isn't darker. It's it's got those elements to push it to an R rating, but it's not darker. It's stupider. And it's weird because looking at this, you're like, oh, Guillermo, you can actually almost picture Guillermo del Toro's designs for some of these characters and they would have been awesome. And I'm not saying that as someone who is like, oh, they should have made the third one or, oh, Guillermo del Toro's Hellboys are outstanding. Like, I tried to watch the first one. I, well, I did watch the first one again. It doesn't hold up very well, by the way. And I haven't watched the second one since I saw it in cinemas. So I'll have to watch that and see if it holds up a bit better. The soundtrack, oh my God. <laughs> The soundtrack is laughably bad. It also reminds me of Suicide Squad. You know where they use obvious like soundtrack choices? It might be worse than this. I can't confirm it because I didn't know some of the songs. But a few times, I'm sure I heard lyrics that were like devil or demon. And that was when there was lyrics. When there wasn't lyrics, it's the most stock rock music ever. Oh, it's bad. Not good at all, like. There's a lot of scenes that are just thrown in there for no real reason. In fact, the first 30 minutes of the movie, there's just like a little plot thread. It feels like they were just like, oh, we can get this in. Comic book fans will love this. Or it'll look good in trailers. It doesn't really have a purpose. They just kind of quickly move on and the plot starts up again. And there's a, more than one scene like that. Which is just totally pointless. It feels like padding. I was mostly uninterested in the film. It just feels very cheap. I don't think it's as bad as the reviews are saying, but it's totally pointless. If it was on, like, say, Netflix or on TV, I don't think people would care as much. People might even watch it. If it was, like, a Hellboy TV series or something. But this is really just a mess. I, it was, I was bored, for the most part. And the fact I'm bored watching a film with violent swearing, the devil and Ian McShane is not a good sign, because it should be pretty easy to keep my attention. Uh, yeah, I, uh, there's two credit scenes. The first was pretty pointless. It was like a mid-credit scene. The second one I didn't bother saying for because they were tidying up the cinema and I figured, hey, it's not worth inconveniencing them to see this. I read it after. It sounds like a sequel bait. The biggest sequel bait actually comes just before the credits. In fact, there's a whole scene before the credits where it seems like they're like, this is what, this is what it'll be like. Please come back for another one. It'll be like this. It's too too little too late I think if you're going to go if look if you've seen Suzanne if there's nothing you want to see in cinemas and you just want to go to cinema and you can't wait for Endgame it'll kill two hours but it's not a good movie wasn't entertained by it I want to say it's the worst film I've yeah probably it's the worst film I'd say I've reviewed since I started the podcast it's that or Glass but Glass I at least found interesting and different I was invested in Glass at least up until the ending. This, I don't think I was ever invested in. The cinematography and the lighting is okay at times. That I will say that. But, yeah, this is definitely the worst film I've reviewed in the podcast, actually. I'd, I'd say that. And I, I was no fan of Glass overall. But, yeah, this is not a good movie. And I don't know what happens now. I think this might be the end of Hellboy for foreseeable future because not doing well with when it comes to reviews. Can't imagine it's going to do well in the box office either. So, there you go, Hellboy. Do not see it. Well, since we're on a big comic book swing, I realised that because of a few of a few deadlines that approached us and because I missed a week, we have Endgame coming out now in two weeks. So I have the first phase of Marvel movies reviewed. I think it was maybe my eighth episode, if you want to go back. Now we have to review the second phase of the Marvel Universe. And then next week will be the third, and then finally we'll have Endgame. And then I can rest and take a break from Marvel before it all starts up again in like two weeks because they'll probably release something massive again like they always do okay so this is the MCU phase two with the success of the Avengers in 2012 Marvel had proven that they were a power to be reckoned with and that this new phase of films would give us more of the heroes we loved along with some new ones while every studio in Hollywood seemed to dive into their IPs to judge which one they could build a shared universe around 
Marvel began their growth and hoped to establish their dominance. However, whether or not they could sustain interest, and if they were going to be revealed as formulaic or not directly or friendly, hung above their head. With Phase 2, they hoped to buck that trend. However, before we go any further, perhaps we should mention a factor that went unnoticed for so long by many, and that is the Marvel Creative Committee. Last time I mentioned that Marvel may have been close to getting a reputation for not being good with giving total creative control, and the committee was a huge part of that. While a team of knowledgeable individuals about the comics could help with establishing the world in Phase 1 and give a strong foundation, the hard part of that was actually bringing the Avengers together. And that was done now. If there was a time for more creative voices to be heard, and for directors to have more creative control, now was that time. However, as we'll see, Phase 2 would be marked with creative strife of its own. With a lot of the creative committee answering to the CEO of Marvel Entertainment, Ike Perlmutter. And this has changed over time, but Phase 2 was a time that these issues arose quite often. I find it interesting that only one director from the first phase made it to Phase 2, and he would soon be pushed out due to creative tampering, that being Joss Whedon. Phase 2 for Marvel was very much a case of growing pains, but that wasn't always reflected in the finished products. So let's take a look. After the Avengers, we'd have to wait almost a year for our next entry in the MCU, and that would be the final film in the Iron Man trilogy. Iron Man had long been the linchpin for the MCU, but until now his solo films were directed by Jon Favreau. This time, however, the films would go in a new direction, under the command of Shane Black. So how did Iron Man 3 turn out? This is probably the most love-hate film in the whole MCU, especially over that divisive twist, but people also complain that there isn't enough Iron Man in the movie. Well, this might be a bit controversial to say, but I think they are some dumb things to complain about, but we'll get to that, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. I think it's actually a pretty great movie. It's original, and I can see why that might annoy Pure to the comics, but personally I've never minded that much. At least for this movie, I feel like the positives outweigh the negatives. And at times we can accuse Marvel of watering down the creative voice of the director for something more formulaic, and whatever else you want to say, this is very clearly a Shane Black film. It's set at Christmas, there's body cop elements, and the humour is very much in fitting with that. Personally I enjoy Shane Black, and I don't think that liking his work necessarily means you like this movie, but I certainly enjoy it a lot. Let's talk about what works. After Iron Man 2 and the Avengers made Tony an almost invincible character, in that he had essentially conquered almost everything, this film took a step back. It doesn't focus on Iron Man, it focuses on the man, Tony Stark. Tony has a brash arrogance in a few of the movies, so it's nice that we have a film where he seems weak and a bit more grounded. I feel like that was needed post-Avengers, because he was at a point where he seemed almost invincible, and the idea of a PTSD-stricken Tony, who has to survive without his suits, allows us to see the strength of this character again. His intellect and ingenuity with his back against the wall, so to speak. That's what led to him surviving that shrapnel to begin with in the first place. And that's sort of why people ripped this movie apart, at least one of the aspects, for not having enough Iron Man. And really, this movie was telling the story of what Tony is without Iron Man. It actually comes back to what Captain America says to Tony in the first Avengers movie. Big man in a suit of armour, take that away, what are you? Tony seeks to answer that question in his movie. He's focused to prove himself as a man again, and it works for the best, in my opinion. It really proves the depth of his character. The jokes in the film are really good too. I think this is, might be the best example of Marvel balancing the humour well. It's not overkill, and most of them hit without undercutting a dramatic moment. Compared to some of the previous movies with Iron Man, he comes off as a little bit more bearable as a person in this. So what about set pieces? The ending with the Iron Legion is fun, but obviously it's a shame that so many unique suits just went to complete waste. Even the fact that some of them have different specialities didn't really matter in the end. Let's get to the more controversial elements then. First off we have the Mandarin twist, so... Essentially, the character that we thought was the Mandarin the whole film isn't the Mandarin, he's an actor. Played by Ben Kingsley. Now, some people take issue with there being a twist at all. As in, the Mandarin should be the Mandarin, that's it. I don't think that's a problem, but I have a different issue with the twist. So, Kingsley as the Mandarin is brilliant. He gives a great performance that's very believable as the villain. You could totally accept that as the Mandarin in this movie. And even his performance as Trevor, he's funny and he manages to give a, a totally different but still good performance. So that isn't my issue with the twist, it's not that... He's not the Mandarin. My issue is that this worked as a kind of a modern day 
kind of commentary on terrorism and the way the media reacts to that. I didn't see it coming, which is really a rarity with these movies. But my problem is that the Mandarin was played so well and they essentially throw him away, which would be fine if there was something decent to replace him. But there kind of isn't. Guy Pierce just is not good enough to fill that gap in the movie after the Mandarin is gone. I find the character of Alder Killian to be uninteresting. His motive for going after Stark is a bit weak and he doesn't make for a very compelling villain. In essence, he's the Mandarin and he actually says as much. But I don't think his performance is like bad. It's just that there was not much to that character. And the Mandarin was far more interesting in that vein. It feels like the character is only there so there is a villain when that twist is revealed. I know the whole Mandarin controversy has been retconned as well. They had that one shot all hail the king. But let's be honest, they're not... That's not going to be used again. It's not likely they're going to come back to the Mandarin. Certainly not anytime soon. Then again, did people really expect or want Ben Kingsley to be shooting lasers at Iron Man? That just seems a bit much. I don't think that would have worked either. As I said, I feel like this movie works good as a commentary on terror and the media and the deception of not having a real Mandarin works as a statement on how terrorist organizations can kind of sway the media and how they can basically mold their own narrative. The other new characters, I mean, I think there's only one really that we need to discuss. Maya Hansen, played by Rebecca Hall, who has nothing to do really. And it again seems like a creative decision from Marvel because apparently she was initially meant to be a bit more villainous. Essentially, Maya was said to be female Killian. But Meryl felt that the toys wouldn't sell if it was female. Because like, I'm sure a lot of kids bought those Aldrich Killian toys in there. It's a shame that they did that because her character, as a result, doesn't have much to do. And it feels like both characters suffer as a result of that choice. Marvel often came under fire for lack of representation, especially early on. And in the toy market, that was very, very evident when it came to Black Widow merchandise and the like. Shane Black has even said that subsequently that that wouldn't be an issue now that Ike is gone and Feige is in charge. So seemingly it's a case of corporate pushback and creative control taken from the director, which, as you'll see, that happens quite a bit throughout this phase, unfortunately. So let's talk about the post credit scene and Stanley Cameo. Our Stanley Cameo, he is a judge of the beauty pageant and he gives a girl a 10. Ah, you know, not too bad. Stan gets to have a bit of fun. The post credit scene, this is probably the weakest post credit scene out of maybe any of the Marvel movies. So... It's just revealed that Bruce Banner was listening to him tell the story and he fell asleep. Yeah, there was nothing to it really. It's just a joke. I, I think I heard, I, I remember at the time they were talking about maybe not putting in post credit scenes after Avengers, but regardless, this one just isn't very interesting. <laughs> it's kind of pointless. It's one you could easily skip and not regret it. So overall, the film we got is great in my opinion. Even though a lot of people dislike it, it has its issues. I think we get to explore the character Tony Stark and we see him out of his depth. The action is good and different. It's not just all suits firing. We got some gunfights hand to hand, different scenarios with suits. Sometimes half on, other times a pe only a piece of it's on. And it keeps things fresh. The Air Force One scenes is intense and unique and the practical elements really add to it too. I do think certain parts of this feel somewhat retcon now. For example, Extremis. You're not saying that might have been a bit handy in the MCU. Or Tony getting the shrapnel out. It, it's essentially, he still has the arc, so he still has to wear the suit, so it doesn't really make a big difference. It just makes it seem a bit unnecessary. I'll say the music isn't too bad. The score over the end credits, essentially. And the film has a bit of wit. I think it falls just short of the first Iron Man. Again, I have my issues, but I think this is a great film, just maybe not for total purists. Two films a year tended to be the trend in the MCU for Phase 2, and the same year as the device of Iron Man 3, we got a sequel to a film that people weren't crazy about to begin with. While the first tour was a success, people were generally unswayed by it. Following on from the success of the Avengers though, people were more eager to see more Thor. Whedon had found the humour in the God of Thunder and dialed back some of the Shakespearean elements of the Branna version. With a more Avengers influenced Thor and under the guidance of Game of Thrones alum Alan Taylor, fans hoped we would get to see an intergalactic epic with Thor and Loki we all love from the Avengers. Well, when people talk about the weak films in the MCU, this is normally a film that they mention, and yeah, that's probably warranted. When it comes to a bland Marvel film, this is certainly one of the biggest offenders. It's a film that seems to have taken some of the criticisms of the first film on board, but failed to all the same. 
the dialogue is blech and the jokes are all duds for the most part. Natalie Portman, Darcy and the intern are just absolutely insufferable. I don't understand why they thought it'd be a good idea to double down on them. They really seem to think Kat Dennings is so quirky and funny, but it's really trying too hard and it grates on you. There's nothing worse than a comic relief that doesn't work and she is that. It's also probably got the worst villain in any of the Marvel movies as well, at least in my opinion. The Dark Elves aren't that interesting. Malekith is boring. He doesn't do much of merit. He spends half his time not even interacting with anyone but his henchmen, delivering cliched lines in Elvish. He's just so boring. Even the worst Marvel villains have a moment or two that make them interesting, but not this one. Jane is no good either, for whatever reason. Portman and Hemsworth just don't really have chemistry. And then what well, Odin actually does a part that doesn't make sense. He starts off lecturing Loki about how they're no different to humans and should be equal. And then as soon as Jane is in Asgard, he loses his shit for bring, Thor bringing a mortal there. She's just there for most of the movie, really. Jane is. They make the Aether inhabit her and try to get her pivotal to the plot, but there's no real moment where she seems necessary at all. Loki, on the other hand, though, is perfect in this. He gets some real emotional moments and gets a bit more development. He's trapped in the dungeons for his attack on New York, which, by the way, this is just an aside, right? The prisons or the dungeons in Asgard suck. All that happens is a guy pushes someone else into it and punches it, and then it's just open. They're all open. It's ridiculous. If there, like This is meant to be an advanced society, and that's how easy it was, which is... I don't know, maybe it was just like a lazy creative choice. But anyway, we see Loki's emotional state a bit in this movie. How he really does have a love for his mother, Frigga. And even Odin, to a certain degree, does a sort of begrudging love or respect, I think, for, for Odin throughout the film. And we sort of see that explored a bit more in Thor Ragnarok as well as his uh, affection for Odin. Not to mention, we of course see Thor's relationship with Loki, uh, which is still quite tender and that they wish they could be brothers, but they realise that they're almost too different. And we get some laughs out of it, but we also get a few sweeter moments, like when they stop fighting, as they know that's not what their mother would want. So it's a nice moment, which brings us to the death of Frigga, uh, of course, uh, their mother. The invasion of Asgard is actually a pretty fun scene, getting to see nearly every character fight is a bit of fun. The Dark Elf ships as well, I, I think they're quite a cool design in that scene. Asgard looks as cool as it did in the first film as well, I will say. The invasion scene ends with the death of Frigga, which is sort of a shame because Rene Russo finally gets a bit of screen time and then she just gets killed off. However, her death scene is well done and it actually manages to get some emotions for a character we really don't know that well going off the last film. Her funeral scene is also beautifully shot, looks fantastic. The music in that scene as well is memorable and it's really tender. I think they actually bring it back briefly in, in Ragnarok. But it's a really good piece of music considering how often Marvel gets criticised for what is, you know, normally, to be fair, forgettable enough music. This is a worthy standout. After her death, the movie picks up a little bit, mostly due to the interaction between Thor and Loki again. The complexity of the relationship gets played out a little bit. The action in the film is also good at times, but a little stale. There's not really any surprises in Thor's combat. The film's strength should be in the exploration of the different realms, but the problem is none of those realms feel different or distinct or even interesting. They all just kind of seem brown and grey, no real difference between them. The film is really only held together by its characters and the issue with that is that the only interesting characters in the film are Thor and Loki and they're not together for all that long. Other than that we're dealing with Thor and his Earth friends or just scenes with Malekith and both of those are rather dull. Simply put the film just isn't that exciting, there's nothing special about it. The movie feels like it is on autopilot for most of it and it doesn't make it bad, it just makes it a really bland Barely forgettable film. For a character as out there as Thor, it's a shame how sterile this film seems. He should be a character with stunning visuals and epic scales, but this feels really neutered. The film has a few brief good moments, which is what makes it even more frustrating. One of those moments is a brief Captain America cameo, when Loki pretends to be him, which is brilliant. Loki and Thor confront Malekith. It's quite exciting, including Loki's death, which, as I understand, was actually meant to be permanent until the audience saw it and disliked it. The final act in London with the rifts into other dimensions and changes in gravity is a bit of fun because it's far more creative than the rest of the film and the final twist that Loki is now on the throne is intriguing but it doesn't really go anywhere. It's briefly there in Ragnarok but that's kind of it. It's brushed aside quite quickly. 
Uh, the Stanley cameo. He's in the, an insane asylum uh, with Stellan Skarsgård. And uh, he's explaining the universes and the convergence and all this. And Stanley has given him his shoe to use it. So he just says, can I have my shoe back? Pretty fun cameo. And it also references the Marvel 616 on the on the chalkboard. So that's pretty, you know, not a, not, the, not the best cameo, but it's funny enough. Not bad. End credits. Uh, we get two end credit scenes, actually. One of them I quite like, and that is the scene where the Warriors 3, or at least Sif and... Volstag? I'm going to say Volstag. I'm going to wager that his name is Volstag. <laughs> they give the Aether to the Collector, played by Benicio del Toro. Uh, I'm all for Benicio del Toro as a Collector. I think he's hilarious. And we get, our, I think, our first official mention of the Infinity Stones, which is pretty good. And, of course, we see he's trying to gather the Infinity Stones for Thanos. And then at the very end, we see Thor returns to Earth, which is sort of like, whatever. Again, that's it's not a big deal. Thor the Dark World is a frustrating watch. It combats some of the complaints the MCU often faces, music and emotion for one. However, none of the characters are that interesting, save for Loki and Thor. Our plot and our villain are nothing worth getting invested in either. All of these are vital major issues. But what it results in is a movie that is forgettable but easy to watch. It's not outright bad, it's just bland and it's soulless. While we don't know the full extent of whether this movie was messed up by the creative committee, it was not without issue. A lot of issues, in fact. Something that emerges quite often in these first two phases is actors and creators disgruntled with the process at Marvel. First off, this film was meant to be directed by Patty Jenkins, who left due to creative differences. She wasn't happy with the script, and Marvel didn't let her change it. She had a different idea focusing on the separation of Thor and Jane and their love. Very different to what we got, obviously. And considering she went on to make Wonder Woman, maybe they should have listened. In fact, it was Natalie Portman who apparently wanted her on board, and when she left, Portman wanted to leave too but was seemingly forced into making the movie due to her contract. And because of this, before she has stated it's unlikely she will return, I think she's softened her position a bit on that in later years. Christopher Eccleston described working on the movie as like putting a gun in his mouth. The director, Alan Taylor, also felt like the film was meddled with heavily by executives in post-production. It seemed like at Marvel, a pattern was starting to develop where you did things their way or they'd make it their way without you. Perhaps this is why more and more we see smaller filmmakers take the reins of these films as it allows them to experience on a big blockbuster while allowing Marvel to steer the ship a bit. They needed to prove that Marvel was still a place where big films could be made that didn't suffer from creative meddling. The second phase of the MCU was now almost a year old, and it was off to a rocky start. We had the device of Iron Man 3, followed by the relatively dismissed Thor The Dark World. While both films had succeeded financially, the question became whether the audience would consistently come for average solo films, especially when the links to the next Avengers seemed more and more tenuous. With two films before Age of Ultron, Marvel needed some momentum, and that came with The Winter Soldier. A lot of people consider this one of the best Marvel films, and something of a turning point for the MCU. For me, it is up there among the very best of the Marvel movies, along with being one of, if not the best, solo films. Darker territory for Marvel overall, it took a more grounded approach to the characters of Captain America, but managed to maintain some of its comic book identity. Batrock the Leaper and Zoda, for example, make it into the film. The action and fight choreography of the film is also outstanding. A very realistic blend of martial art that doesn't take away from the superpower element of the character, but it makes the character feel a bit more vulnerable and real as a result. Especially in the fights with Bucky, but even in scenes where it opens on the ship, it's intensely violent and it shows that Cap has grown since his time in the first Avengers film. And it sets you up for a more serious and darker movie with a more complex Steve Rogers. If there is a movie that made Cap the icon he is, I think this is it. His moral code is questioned and he sticks by his convictions and what is right, but it doesn't feel dogmatic. He has to really explore it and question himself, you know? What's great with the Russos on board is that they have great handling on ensemble casts, and the film never loses focus or momentum to build those characters or the world they inhabit. It does so in natural progression with the plot. When it comes to cast, this film became a great vehicle for characters of the Marvel movies that were unlikely to get their own films. Nick Fury, for example, he gets a lot more to do in this film, and he gets a lot more fleshed out as well. He's a slightly more reserved performance than Simon L. Jackson normally gets, and it's a great job of setting as this unstoppable super spy. Even giving him an action scene that is intense and is also suited to the character's strengths. It doesn't feel like it's out of place for him to do that. The chase scene when the intense machine gun fire, he's like, it really is a spy of his age. It's suited to the character very, very well. Black Widow. We really get to see her kick ass in this, and I feel like if there was a film that defined her fight style, this was it. 
and it, that also includes, I would say, her arsenal of weapons, probably more so than even the Avengers. Having her realise she might have been working for the bad guys again is a good insight into her character and her past. As for new characters, uh, well, sort of a new character, the return of Sebastian Stan as Bucky Barnes, but more specifically, I guess, the Winter Soldier. He's an intimidating presence here. Bucky was a bit underdeveloped in the first Captain America movie. Having him return as a Winter Soldier, he felt like a totally new character. Having the personal connection to Steve Rogers is welcome, though, especially as he is a man out of time. Essentially, Bucky is the closest he can ever get to his past. The world has changed since he's been gone. Peggy Carter is old and bedridden. Anyone else would be dead or nearly dead except for Bucky. So it weaves a complex link to his past and gives a depth to the character that doesn't warrant much exploration, which is good. The design and fight choreography also make him an amazing physical challenge in the film, and he's a very memorable aspect of it. Then we have Anthony Mackie as the Falcon. He's really, really good. He's charismatic and entertaining consistently, and he has very good chemistry with the cast as a whole. And of course, Hail Hydra, the Hydra Trist, which is really well done. It's an interesting wrinkle to the plot. Whether it has major impacts, though, is probably up for debate. It's fun to look back on some of these films and speculate whether some people were acting for Hydra. But on the other hand, a lot of the more serious and dramatic stuff kind of goes out the window a bit in the third act, which is good. But it feels like they just needed a big third act and they went out of the way for it, like a lot of Marvel movies. But it doesn't take away from the film overall. Also, they mentioned Stephen Strange, which is kind of weird. We might talk about that when we talk about Doctor Strange next week. But what is interesting is that the Russos insist this is a film that had no involvement from the creative committee. Perhaps it's just a coincidence, but it is interesting that one of the films without intervention ended up being one of the best. Stan Lee cameo in this. He is a security guard in the museum and Cap breaks in and steals his suit and he says, God, I'm so fired. <laughs> which is... Kind of funny and a little bit sad that his advanced age Stan is the security guard at a museum, but it's quite funny that he that he's now going to be fired, I guess. It's funny that a, a senile old man is going to be fired for his job working at a museum. Oh, well, no, it's, nice. it's a nice scene to have. It's, I like when a Stan Lee cameo, we get to have a bit of bit of humour and it, when he gets to dress up, it's nice. The credits, we have a very good credit scene here, actually, to be fair. The birth of the twins, Wanda and Pietro Maximov. They are experimenting with the scepter and we see that they're testing out their powers and they're the only two that survived. And they're under, I guess, the watchful eye of Baron von Strucker, which ties into Age of Ultron. It's a pretty cool intro for them. And then at the very end, we see Bucky learning about his past in the museum. We're kind of learning who he is, which is quite an interesting wrinkle that will come up, of course, in the next Captain America film, Civil War. In closing, The Winter Soldier took Marvel in a more serious direction but didn't set out the comic book aspects for that. It really established so many characters better than they ever have been before. Cap, Black Widow and Nick Fury, for example, in my opinion. It gave us great new characters like Falcon and The Winter Soldier while also giving us a twist that works and a Marvel film that strikes a great balance of realism without taking away from the sillier aspects of the movie. It was a more serious superhero film that didn't sell out its roots. It was a bit darker, it had more intensity, and that dose of realism really sold it. And it was probably, and maybe still is, one of the best solo films I've ever done. And I think it adds to the fact that the Captain America trilogy is the strongest superhero trilogy in the MCU. With Marvel coming off one of their biggest critical successes, all eyes now turned to what was considered their riskiest film to date. The first non-sequel of Phase 2, Guardians of the Galaxy. Even to avid comic readers, the title was a little bit obscure. Whereas Marvel had normally focused on super or enhanced individuals to this point, now they were looking to focus on a team of characters in outer space, including the likes of a talking tree and a raccoon. It was an odd choice, and when Marvel announced James Gunn was going to direct, mostly known for his work with Troma, where he made B-movies and Splatter movies, along with his deconstruction of superhero vigilantes with Super, it raised a lot of eyebrows, and people wondered if this could be the first big dent in Marvel's now illustrious armour. What's fantastic about this film is how unlike the other Marvel films it is. It's odd and emotional, it has a gorgeous visual style and colour palette, but it still has some darker elements. It just feels so original despite having so many familiar aspects. It's got a pulpy sense of nostalgia, while still being a sci-fi story with unique visual flourishes, and it works astoundingly well, even having characters who aren't really good people for most of the film. is a refreshing change of pace. It's one of those great ensemble movies where you can pick any character as your favourite and it's hard to argue against it. 
So let's talk about those characters. First off, we have Star-Lord or Peter Quill. He's this immature but charming human who was taken from Earth quickly after the death of his mother. Chris Pratt plays the character perfectly. This is kind of his star-making turn in Hollywood. Even though he's unlikable in some aspects, the character has a pretty clear emotional core and a good heart. And we obviously feel sympathy for him because the film starts with the death of his mother. Gamora, our female lead, is intriguing as well. She's the daughter of Thanos, which is a good bit of her backstory and it connects it to this wider universe. But she's a badass and she handles herself very well, while seemingly being the most sane and grounded person in the group as well. So that certainly helps. Drax, played by Dave Bautista, he's hilarious. Some of the best lines of the film belong to him and how literally he is. But he also has an undoubtable physical presence. He has a nice arc as well about, you know, moving on and finding, I guess, a new family. And there's a lot of emotional elements to do with the fact that he lost his family. And then we come to some of the stranger characters, but maybe arguably the breakout to the movie, and that is Rocket and Groot. So Rocket Raccoon, the cybernetically enhanced raccoon. While in a lesser movie, these characters are kind of be played for comedic purposes and not much more. They have a bit more going on than that in this movie. Rocket has a short fuse, doesn't really trust anyone but is also incredibly good with the mechanical side of things. And while he has an inferiority complex, he finds a best friend in Groot due to both of them being so different and to a certain degree outcasts. Groot, while simple in his language, has such a sweet side to his character and his simplicity and uniqueness makes him a bit of a scene stealer, much more likable than the other Guardians. Not to mention the moments where he saves them and says, we are Groot. And I think that's a good indication of the movie as a whole. The film has weird elements that shouldn't work, but it somehow does when brought together like the Guardians themselves and beneath some of the rougher, violent or darker elements in the film, there's an undoubtedly clear heart to it and a real sense of fun. A lot of the side characters are interesting too. The Nova Corps, including John C. Reilly, Glenn Close and Peter Serafinowicz have some great scenes. Nebula is a good henchman and the connection between her and Gamora adds to that character a lot, something which comes up again in the sequel. Yondu and the Ravagers get some moments to shine without seeing focus. And the collector, as I said, he's so absurd, I find him really entertaining. But then we have the villain, who is pretty one note. It's kind of the probably the weak part of this film. He's an extremist who wants to support his cause by getting the Power Stone. It's fairly straightforward. It's not that interesting, and he doesn't have much to do either, which same goes for Korra, the Pursuer. It also makes the ending feel a bit less important. Certainly the big action end piece is fine, and it allows our team to be heroic. However, it feels like their arc is more or less complete when they realise they are something of a family and the action at the end is just icing on the cake. Although I don't particularly love the dance-off scene, I feel it goes one step too far though. Then again, the action in the movie for the most part is great, especially of the breakout from the prison, and I enjoy how each character has their different uses and styles when they fight. They all feel slightly different. What does work so well about the movie is the world that's created. It's weird and interesting, and it manages to feel original doesn't feel like any other Marvel or superhero film. The costumes, effects and makeup are flawless and colourful and really drag you into that world. Then we of course have the soundtrack which was a breakout hit. The soundtrack was actually something the Marvel Creative Committee has suggested removing. And just as a footnote, James Gunn has spoken in the past about the issues he had with the committee but the film still feels unmistakably James Gunn. And it's the better for it. The soundtrack for a lot of reasons, it isn't just like a pointless compilation of songs, like a lot of films have tried to copy it. But first of all, the music is diegetic and it serves a purpose to the story most of the time. It also serves as Peter's only real connection to his dead mother and to his home planet. And in the end, we see that he finally opens up the present his mother gave to him before she died. And it's a sign of acceptance and even closure to a certain degree. The Guardians finding each other and becoming a surrogate family allowed them to move on and that is the case for a lot of these characters they found each other and are the better for it or so it seems at least it's about characters who are really looking for a degree of redemption and they're kind of these lost souls and they come together as a family and because of that they're better people which is a very sweet very compelling arc to give such strange characters to show that they're not irredeemable there is a way back for them something that would be explored even more about the idea of keeping this family together and how these combustible elements can work but that's something we will talk about when we talk about phase three next week when it comes to the stan lee cameo we have him as a kind of talking to a younger woman and it's one of my favorite ones actually i love anyone where it's like they kind of poke a bit of fun and he's looking rocket is looking through the binoculars he's stan lee and he goes uh, he calls him a class a creeper which is pretty great 
our credit scenes, we have a mid credit scene, which is dancing Baby Groot. And he keeps stopping dancing when Drax is looking at him. I'm not crazy for it, you know, as much as it's nice to see that Groot is alive and dancing. It's kind of, and it's kind of cute. I mean, it's just not that interesting. It's it's fine. It's kind of a throwaway one, in my opinion. And then the last one we have, Howard the Duck cameo, which was such a surprise at the time. And it's it's funny. It's nice that they kind of showed like, hey, even though Howard the Duck was one of the biggest bombs ever, let's give him an olive branch. So it's nice. And of course, if there was a film turn to be introduced, Guardians Galaxy is probably a good one for him to be introduced in so you know it's enjoyable and it was unexpected certainly Guardians of the Galaxy and Marvel had taken one of their most obscure properties and made not only a critical success but a commercial one people ate up the Guardians of the Galaxy it seemed like nothing could stop the momentum Marvel had built up with the sequel to the Avengers out the next summer it seemed like the Marvel brand would continue to grow and succeed while every film in phase 2 was a success at least commercially Marvel could now put out a sequel to their biggest hit ever the Avengers and they do that with Avengers Age of Ultron. Joss Whedon was back, along with the rest of the cast, and the promise of new heroes and villains. Ultron is a villain, Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, and Vision. There was a lot to add, and the hype was at an all-time high. So did it deliver? Well, let's start at the start. So the opening scene of this film is pretty awesome, actually. Seeing the Avengers in full motion as a polished unit. In fact, this is one of the few times we see them at their best, and a totally competent team when they aren't massively against the odds other aspects of the film it doubles down on the humor i feel that's entirely misguided while the humor worked in the first avengers it was a bit more reserved here it's just a bit too much it feels like they really overdid it watching the first avengers do some jokes that can still make me laugh second one i don't think there's any jokes that, that still get me i feel like they really utilize it poorly with Ultron. I found it very guilty as well at times of undercutting a serious one with a joke and that would be prevalent in some Marvel movies. Speaking of Ultron, the, the scene with two AIs talking is absolutely awful, I think. I know they needed a visual representation of Jarvis being overtaken and Ultron being made, but it is almost laughable to watch. Avengers interaction when they're interacting is still a highlight, for example, when they're all trying to lift the hammer, for example, that's fun. Then we come to a big issue with a lot of the movie. It just tries to do too much. The amount of setup for the future is insane. It seems like another corporate note. There is far too much in this movie. In almost every aspect. But especially when it comes to setting up sequels or other movies. It just tries to do too much of that. Marvel wanted apparently Whedon to cut the scene of Hawkeye and the Avengers at the farm. And put in a scene of Thor setting up the Infinity Stones. It's just a film that's overstuffed. And again, you see a, a corporate note there as well that they wanted to do that. But the film suffers from exposition and pointless moments to tease other films. And Ultron isn't as menacing as he should be either. I think this is a big problem with the film is Ultron. As I said before about the humour, it's, it's too much. It overdoes it. Ultron's design as well, it starts off kind of decent, but design gets a bit worse in my opinion. It looks very boring and it could have looked a little bit more intimidating. And also... I don't think there's a lot of reason for Ultron to be like Tony in this. I mean, he kind of is. Aside from the comic book parallel of Ultron being based off his creator, which in the comics was Hank Pym. And sure, he programmed Jarvis, but Jarvis isn't cracking wise or anything, so it doesn't fit in that regard. Or maybe they just made him a sassy robot, which is really stupid as well. Like, he's a robot. And he should be menacing, unemotional, and cold. It would make him far more intimidating as a villain, and he'd be far more focused on his goal. So he'd be actually more threatening and would be make for a more interesting film as a whole. We shouldn't be trying to laugh along with him. Like imagine if Thanos was constantly cracking boys and making jokes. And when you watch the original trailers for the film, it's such a different tone. It's a shame the film wasn't closer to that. It's just a shame that Ultron is a bit of a letdown as a villain. He's not completely awful, but he's more just a waste of potential. The drones actually look a bit more like the comic version. I think their design is better overall. And the character development, on the other hand, for, I would say, the main Avengers, is fairly good. Seeing the, the vision that they, they see gives us a bit of insight into their character. Cap realising the life he can never have. Black Widow's upbringing and training. Thor's vision and worry at the end uh, that he's going to bring about the end of Asgard, Ragnarok. Seems very fitting, in retrospect, 
when you look at Thor Ragnarok actually. The Hulkbuster and Hulk fight is fantastic, it's shot from an almost civilian perspective. It being the moment where the team is broken and it's great to have them rebuild. It makes for a strong idea. In, uh, we saw them in the first one being triumphant and coming together and this is kind of them almost being broken apart and having to form together. It really tests their metal a bit. And it leads to some welcome Hawkeye characterization because of how often he draws a sore straw. And getting to see the characters realise their weaknesses and worries and insecurities is key to the film. Banner knowing that he can never have a normal life and that no matter how much he manages to control himself and does good in the world, he will never get the life he wants. Thor worried about his place in Asgard and whether he will bring about the end of his people and his home, whether he can be a, a decent leader. Black Widow's feeling that she can never do enough good to shake off her training and original purpose to murder and do bad. In fact, a lot of people have issues with the Hulk and Black Widow's romance, but as much as I have some issue with it and it comes out of nowhere, the movie does demonstrate why they go together well. They're both characters who feel no matter what good they do, they can never have the life they want. They can never have normal lives and I feel like that's why they gravitate towards each other. The film in general deals with the duality of what the lives of these heroes are. While many of the characters eventually come to terms with their lives and find some degree of peace, Hulk doesn't. Feeling like he will always be a threat to others, hence him leaving. And then we have the scene where Thor goes for a swim which is incredibly heavy handed but serves its purpose to give us vision but it's just not really necessary. And that's what I mean. This film has some great moments and great insight into character. And then you have moments like that that are entirely unnecessary. The highway chase is a, is a good action scene as well. I will say that. It offers a lot of variation and it's quite intense to watch if nothing else. Ultron's final design is also like, I didn't like his design to begin with, but it really is uninteresting and it's barely even different to the previous ones. It just doesn't work at, at all in my opinion. In retrospect, this film sets up so many threads for future movies though. We have the divide between Captain and Tony, Sto the Infinity Stones, Thor Ragnarok, Wakanda, even Claw is set up in this film. And I do like the birth of Vision. It's a great sequence with the heroes trying to one-up each other and have actual differences worth fighting over. The film tries to do too much though. It's just a detriment to it. Too many characters, too many plot threads, and it could really do it being a bit more streamlined. Not to mention that originally they were going to put Captain Marvel in there too. Hawkeye being the sort of grounded Avenger though. That's an interesting story and an interesting plot thread. And it really carries the message of the film to Wanda. It doesn't matter what you've done. You're an Avenger. Something that applies to many characters in the film. Whatever is in your past, you have a shot of redemption. Essentially, if the first film is the construction of the Avengers, this is their deconstruction. The larger than life heroes of the first film are brought down to more human levels. They have fears, emotions, even families. There's a lot of shots from the people's perspective in this film that does an understated job of showing us that the human side of the heroes is not without merit. The first film gave us the heroes being seemingly unstoppable together. But here we see that even though they can be strong united, they are vulnerable physically, mentally or emotionally. The final fight does have its issues. There is a common complaint that it's just a wave of mindless drones, but there are moments where it shines. Wanda realising her purpose, Thor, Tony and the Vision concentrating their beams on Ultron, that glamour shot of them all fighting at once. Wanda going psychopathic in the wake of Quicksilver's death it really gives you hope for a House of M style story at some point, but that's probably unlikely to happen I guess. The film in a lot of ways though just clashed tonally. Some of the silliest, the most comic booky things in any movie are in this film. And when you put that against the more real, serious aspects of the movie, there's a real disconnect. I think people wanted something more like the first Avengers movie. And because of that, they dismiss the other parts, which are deeper, that they get, should get credit for, really. However, on the whole, the film just doesn't work. It tries to do too much, and we're left with a film that struggles under the weight of all the stuff, and it ends up not being satisfying. It feels like a movie that was rushed in a couple of ways. Ultron isn't a compelling villain. Scarlet Witch is fine, but doesn't have much to do. Quicksilver is worse than her, as far as development. There just isn't a lot to him, especially since we saw the character in X-Men Days of Future Past and he was a bit of a highlight. He just seems like a bit of a letdown overall. I like their backstory though, and how it ties into their hate for the Avengers and Stark, but they aren't that interesting in the film, as much as it is nice to have characters with a more diverse moveset. There is a good film in Age of Ultron, somewhere.
but it's buried deep under a mound of characters and unnecessary setup. It does have its moments though. The action is good for the most part and our established characters get a bit more depth. However, a lot of the new elements don't work. Humor is overdone in it. The new characters and the villain don't deliver all that much and it's nowhere near the first Avengers. It feels like a film made by committee and that's what I mean. This movie broke Joss Whedon with all the meddling and studio notes and it feels like that. It tries to do too much and as a result it fails. Bringing us to our Stan Lee cameo at a party in the Avengers headquarters and there are veterans and Stan Lee is talking to Thor and Thor is bigging up this alcoholic drink from Asgard and he says big deal give it to me <laughs> and next we see him cut, it cuts to a scene of him being carried out and he says Excelsior which is it's pretty funny as nice that he finally got to say one of his trademark phrases which is good. Then we have the end credit scene which this might be one of my least favorite end credit scene and it's just because it's stupid and it should be good. So Thanos picks up an Infinity Gun and just says, I'll do it myself. Here is my problem. Like, who's he talking to? <laughs> like, it doesn't even really make sense because normally this is a case of like, normally these credit scenes come almost directly after the events of the film. Like, it seems like he's saying it in relation to the movie, but obviously he's not because he wasn't watching over this. It doesn't seem like he's had any real effect or impact on the Age of Ultron, or anything to do with it at all. Is this years before, years after? It's just, it's awkward and just kind of like, hey, remember Thanos, he's coming. It's not good. It's a shame, I think I've seen the Russo brothers try to like explain it and they're like, hey, it wasn't our film. <laughs> anyway, this is a film that I don't hate, but it is undeniably a disappointment. It's soulless and it pushes the Marvel Universe to its breaking point. It feels like an example of a studio film. It's not totally without merit. It gave us characters that would work in later films. We do get a bit more development on the characters from the original, but on the whole it fumbles on some key aspects. One of my favourite scenes is when Vision confronts Ultron and they discuss humanity, and Vision says there is grace in our failings. I think that almost applies to this movie. It does some aspects so well, but it is for lack of a better word, a failure. However, if there's one film that showed the failure of the creative committee, it is not reflected in the final product but more and what the final product could have been. Possibly one of Marvel's biggest blunders, and that was Edgar Wright's Ant-Man. With Edgar Wright walking away from the project he'd been developing since before the MCU even started. It was apparently due to the corporate meddling and them changing his script to tie more into the MCU, and he felt he couldn't direct a script that wasn't truly his. And because of that, they lost a very promising directorial voice and scrambled to find a replacement. While they still use some of Wright's work, the question was of whether this could still be a good film without him. The film is suitably smaller in scale, and it is the better for it, but it is easy to feel like the film is light and essential as a result. I think one thing the film does have is a pretty great cast. The movie rests on the very capable performance of Paul Rudd, and while I've seen some people criticise it for just Paul Rudd playing himself, he is charismatic in the lead, and even carries some of the emotional and action beats really well. Michael Penna at times is a little bit much, and maybe even annoying at times, Sometimes he's a stereotype, as some people have suggested, but the other cons are fairly forgettable. Michael Douglas as Hank Pym is great as a sour and stern mentor figure. Vangeline Lilly makes for a good heroine that isn't just your standard love interest, but pivotal to the story as a whole, and even shows that she is better suited for the job, perhaps. Bobby Carnaval is goofy and enjoyable as a cop, and new partner to Scott's ex-wife played by Judy Greer, who is serviceable. I will admit that the daughter, Cassie, I think she's cute and fairly funny, her delivery. Like, for example, when she's given the ugly doll. It's brilliant. While doing this write-up, I nearly forgot about Corey Stoll. And that should probably tell you what I think of his villain. Marvel have an unfortunate trope of having the villain of these films being a sort of evil mirror version of the hero. And here is no different. Although I do want to mention a moment that's frequently forgotten. Possibly the most horrifying death in the whole MCU is in this film. So we're a bad guy, Darren Cross is in the bathroom talking to some guy who disagree with him. And he shoots this guy with a ray gun, which turns him into a pulsating pile of goo. And he wipes him up and flushes him down the toilet. That is like the most messed up death in any of the Marvel movies. Imagine that's how you go. Oof. The film isn't without wit either. If, for example, the safe cracking scene we see is fairly entertaining and quite clever. 
and there is of course quite a few clever lines in it. The movie really does benefit from how small it is, no pun intended. I spoke a bit about this with Captain Marvel, a film that just feels like a smaller film that takes place in this larger universe, like when you just read a random issue of a comic book. Even the fact that we get a brief Avenger cameo with Falcon adds up to that. Having a character who we will never get in their own movie, or will always play second film, getting a chance to steal a scene in another movie is always very entertaining, and that's what the Falcon scene does in this. One thing I do appreciate is the relationship between Scott and Hope. So many of these love stories in the MCU are somewhat rushed or forced, but in this film it happens off screen mostly, and while you could argue that's kind of lazy, to do that I kind of prefer it just because we don't have to put up another tired romance subplot. They have good chemistry and we know they'll get together, so why not just skip to the chase essentially? The action in the film is also quite fresh because of the gimmick of shrinking. In fact, those scenes when he is small, interacting with larger elements are the highlight. The last act in the movie is a lot of fun because of this. It isn't like a world ending scenario, but it is creative and has the right level of intensity. I think with this film, so much of it's bereft of action that when we do get to the end, it feels justified and necessary as opposed to some of the other MCU entries. The shrunken down fighting and location changes makes it a bit more refreshing than it would normally be. It also allows for some interesting visuals when he goes subatomic. The film ends on a bit of a whimper though, I think. Louise goes on a monologue and then says they might be interested in Scott for the Avengers or whatever. Alright then, that's just how it ends. It's kind of a big nothing ending. Stan Lee's cameo is during that montage. Um, not a great cameo, but it is pretty fun to see him mouth crazy stupid fan. Which is, you know, I like any time you got Stan to kind of come out of his comfort zone, it's pretty entertaining. The after credit scene... Actually, we have two scenes. Po- Mid credits, we get uh, Hope finally getting her wasp outfit. It's about time, <laughs> really. It's about damn time. Then we have Civil War scene, which is a little bit awkward and pointless. It's just a scene more as ripped straight out of Civil War. It's just like, hey, this film's coming next. It's fine, but nothing amazing. Coming off the bloated and somewhat disappointing Age of Ultron, Ant Man gave us a small, refreshing palate cleanser. It showed that Marvel could still deliver a small film and focusing on a single hero would benefit the universe as a whole, and that maybe scrambling for the team up wasn't the best approach. Sometimes the films in between could deliver. Then again, it is hard to not hope that we could have got an Edgar Wright film, and whether or not this could have been a bit more lively and ambitious with him at the helm. What we got was good, but fairly unambitious. It seemed like the Marvel creative community may have led to a film that was, ironically, uncreative. With Phase 2 we had Marvel, having some ups and downs amid creative strife. The success of the Avengers had made them somewhat unstoppable, but also led to some laziness. Uninteresting villains, overdone humour, and a lack of ambition were common issues in some of these films. The idea of a creative committee was really to control the people trying to create the movie, and had a negative effect in many cases. By September 2015, Feige had voiced his grievances with Disney higher-ups about the committee, and it would soon disband, just at the end of Phase 2. While they may have had some minor influence on the next phase of films in Phase 3, here Marvel would try to answer some of their critics to make more creative films that address the issues they encountered. Perhaps they were just getting a bit too complacent. Something needed to shake things up. The perfect time for the Avengers to turn against each other. Okay, that is our recap of Phase 2. I guess our review of Phase 2 as well. This is a long episode. (laughs) Apologies for that. As I said, a lot of stuff to discuss next week, including Disney Plus' streaming service, Phase 3. I'll close up on that just before we get to the Avengers. You can get in touch with the pod on Twitter, at pop underscore cult underscore pod, Instagram, pop cult pod, all one word, or pop cult pod at gmail.com. Also, check out the YouTube channel. I've got a better camera on order and some ideas for stuff in the run-up to Endgame that should be a bit of fun. Next week, as I said, Phase 3 of the Marvel Universe and Disney+. Plus. So, wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe or give it a positive review if you're on iTunes. That would be very appreciative. Or just recommend it to a friend. Because remember, can't spell cult without you. Sa-sir-nev. <laughs>